Coming up on Mac Break Weekly, I'm Andy Anatko, subbing for Leo Laporte. Today, we're going to be talking about the 5S and the 5C and iOS 7. Should you be interested in any of those three things? We've got Mike Elgin helping out, along with Renee Ritchie and Tanya Angst, uh, which is going to be navigating a whole bunch of issues, in including the idea, should you or should you not bring a non-Apple phone into an Apple iPhone press event? This is coming up next on MacBreak Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly 368, recorded on September 17th, 2013, the 25th Amendment. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by LegalZoom.com. Visit LegalZoom.com for affordable legal solutions you can trust. LegalZoom's not a law firm. They're better. You can get self-help services at your specific direction or speak to a legal plan attorney to get your questions answered and get ongoing advice. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the promo code MBW to receive $10 off at checkout. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, visit Audible.com slash MacBreak. And by Gazelle. The fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPad, iPhone, or other Apple product is worth at gazelle.com. It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Hello there, I'm Andy Anatko. Leo Laporte is, I'm told he's off in the Middle East directing his first feature film, and as such, I'm going to be filling in as guest host. Uh, but that's okay, we have other people who are hosting too. Uh, starting, of course, with our regular, our beloved Renee Ritchie of imore.com. Renee, how you doing? Great, Andy. And I'm so happy that that squirrel, after his second starring role in an Apple keynote, still went home with you at the end of the day. No, no. See, see, we, we, see of course, every time there's an international standard for anything, somebody has to go and, like, fork it. So the first squirrel that Apple used as a demo photo was a tree squirrel. This this one is a ground squirrel. So I don't know where the standard is now. I'm going to I all of my all of my test data over the past two or three years now is all tree squirrel. I'm going to have to stick with that. But you know, I mean, this is why there's standards committees, people. This is why there's standards committees. Uh, also, on the in the in the roster of people who are probably incredibly stressed out and overworked because we are only a day away from a major <laughs> operating system release, uh, is uh, is Tanya Angst of Take Control Books. Tanya, how you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. <laughs> so you so I, I'm I'm guessing that you have been rather busy over the past couple of weeks ever since they they actually locked down a ship date for OS seven. Yeah, it's it's fairly busy, but we've done this so many times here with the same bunch of people that it's kind of a busy period, but we're not frantic. We're not staying up until two in the morning. We're just, you know, sort of doing what we can with the time we've got and having fun with the new features. <laughs> and yeah, it's, I was. I, I'm glad. You, I'm glad you put it that way because I've talked to other people who've put it in the, in the sense of like there, like there's a there's a there's a broken step uh, up to their apartment building and they keep tripping over it and stubbing their toe. And at this point, they've hurt their toe so much that it doesn't even hurt anymore. So I'm glad you're saying that we've just gotten better at producing those things. We're smarter than. Well, okay, we'll say it's me. Uh, <laughs> also, through some bizarre mistake of geography, Mike Elgin is actually, I understand, in the United States of America. Mike, is that possible? Well, well, New York. New York City. Okay. It's close enough. So, as, or as you refer to it as a connecting city. That's exactly right. A JFK, essentially, is what it is. Not Newark. <laughs> That's the important thing. <laughs> How, how did how did you wind up in in because every every time that every time that you come in you're either in some exotic city and or on your way to another exotic city so you're here for a reason we yeah my wife and I were in living in Florence Italy and minding our own business and having a wonderful time but one of our relatives is actually getting married so we came back for a wedding and while we're here we're going to uh, eat a lot of uh, uh, this strange exotic American food. And uh, see the sights, you know. Um, we've we've seen so much about America on TV. We thought we'd try it. <laughs> well, we'll we'll get on to actual Apple and Mac based stuff. But I I really do have to ask you. I don't know many people who travel as much as you do. Like, what what do you really miss? What do you really have to do when you get back to the United States, even for a few weeks? Well, 
well, I, I, I hope to visit um, the United States myself things, someday, so I want to know what the hotspots are. Yeah, it, it's um, it's uh, it's a it's a mixed bag. I mean, I, you know, there's actually one of the strange realities is that everybody thinks that the food is horrible in the United States and that it's wonderful everywhere else. There's actually a lot of incredibly good food and certainly a way more food variety in the United States than almost everywhere else you live. I mean, you remember that thing from Three Amigos where they're in a little village and uh, Chevy Chase says, uh, you know, do you have anything besides Mexican food? Um, a, lot of, a lot of countries are like that. With, they have their own types of food. Italy has lots and lots of Italian food, not a whole lot of Thai food, stuff like that. So when you get to the United States, you basically can just say, hmm, what, what strange and bizarre foods can we have? So that's, that's one thing. In general, life is very convenient in the United States. Um, so, uh, so basically it's a good time to just be lazy, which I enjoy. <laughs> I, I believe they're, they're adding that to the new redesigned quarter, uh, next year. They've, yes. We, 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 you're, <laughs> welcome to the United States. You have the right to be lazy. Uh, Here's but, a giant car. <laughs> cr crushing a deer underneath its wheels. Uh, so obviously the, the lots of big news this week. Uh, probably the most pressing news for most people who are listening are uh, iOS 7 is going to be dropping on uh, September 18th. It's going to be released tomorrow. Uh, obviously, we're going to have new phones this week too, but the difference is that you can get iOS 7 without having to plunk down $200 and commit to a two-year contract. So there are a lot of people who are going to be navigating the question of whether to upgrade or not. Uh, I, I've had I've had my own little path with iOS 7. I, I kind of avoided trying to talk about it or write about it in the first couple of weeks because Apple was really clear about how big a change they were making and how much this new operating system was going to be evolving between the version that they were showing off at WWDC and the version they would actually ship to customers. We have seen a lot of changes. Um, uh, Renee, what's there, there been? A, what, what do you you've seen now? You've seen screenshots that have been published publicly and therefore can likely comment on what you have seen and your impressions on how much uh, the operating system has evolved since uh, since June. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, iOS 7 is the biggest change to iOS since the first iPhone. And that sounds like, her, like hyperbole, but it's really not. They have redone every pixel of the interface. It's an entirely new design language. They got a really famous game developer to build a physics and particle engine that the entire thing is based on. There's way more gestures, way more direct manipulation. It's much more text-centric. Uh, They've got a whole new system for making dynamic text. And it looks visually very different. They did keep it spatially similar, so your phone icon, will be in the same place your old phone icon is and it looks roughly the same. But I think initial reaction will be kind of jarring. Like every, It looks like a completely new coat of paint. Like you left for a day, someone destroyed your house and built up a Tim Burton house in its place. <laughs> but I think because it's spatially the same, people will get used to it fairly quickly. Mm. Now, now what's the, what, what, can you give examples of what the, what the game engine is lending to? So the game engine, instead of previously, you'd have to spend a lot of time animating any special effect you wanted. And you just couldn't do a lot of stuff. Like you couldn't do the Apple stuff where you would peek into photo stacks. And now everything can be given a behavior. So, for example, in Safari, when you press the tabs button, you get this Rolodex that you can flip through and you can... Because it parallaxes, it understands the direction of your phone. As you move your phone around, you can peek at the cards without touching them. And then you can put your finger on one and either move it around or just toss it off. And that makes it that it, it makes it uh, much more discoverable because you can play. It's how children learn. You can play with all these things and they interact with you. And it also just makes it more delightful. And when you're doing dealing with mainstream computing appliances, the more delightful and playful it is, the easier it is for people who aren't tech savvy or aren't computer literate to just pick it up and use it. Yeah. And and uh, uh, Tanya, how about how about you? I mean, you've you're you have a different attitude in that you've you're sort of your company is in the in the in the business of teaching users how to actually use this damn thing. So have, have, what, what's what's your path been like? Well, I think um, something that we've been talking about an awful lot um, because we do a lot more content where we, as Andy said, we're really trying to teach people how to take control of something, something how to go deep with something. We've realized what a fool's game it is in many ways to give people detailed directions where we tell them exactly where to tap and click because interfaces are changing so rapidly these days that by the time we can write a series of steps and publish it, 
even if we're just publishing it on a web page, you know, it may be changed in a week or two. So we've been talking a lot more about how we can, in our own writing, encourage people, in fact, just like Renee said, to explore, tap around, try a few gestures. You know, if it's not on the upper left of the page, maybe it's on the lower right of the page. So we're trying to really work into, you know, you know, our, you know, corporate DNA, uh, you know, the idea that we need to teach people how to teach themselves, especially people who are maybe a little older or a little set in their ways. They have to continually be giving up uh, clues and signposts and the interfaces they've gotten used to, to learn new things. And I think for a lot of those people, I always said it is going to be very challenging just because visually it is very different, even though a lot of it kind of works the same you know, you finally figured out that, you know, you tap the button that looks like an atom to create a genius playlist, say in iTunes. And now you have to tap the word that says create. So maybe the word create is more obvious, uh, but it's different. So it's going to be interesting to see how people respond and what we can do about it. Yeah, I've uh, it's it's been it's been weird because I've I, I can speak openly about the two times when I've uh, used iOS 7, not under NDA. Uh, I've got so obviously I had some cha I had a lot of time to use it uh, during the uh, press event last week, and I was pleased that a lot of the things that annoyed me back in June are no longer operative. They they went to a, a thicker font that doesn't really disappear uh, as the original <laughs> version of Helvetica disappeared. Uh, they uh, it's they toned down they they adjusted a lot of the translucency, which was to me was the caused so many interface problems. There was there were so many times where uh, when I first used it. I was using uh, the music player app and I thought that, you know, there's a bar at the bottom of, a, you know, genres, artists, playlists, whatever. And I thought that it was trying to tell me that, oh, I'm high, I'm, I'm backlighting this one, uh, the, the playlist section in red to let you know there's a problem here that you need to check out. But it turned out that, no, I just was scrolling through a list of albums and Beatles number one, which is a red album cover, happened to be behind that button, that button bar. So it was not so stuff like that has been adjusted. And thank and thank God they changed the the the, the lock screen uh, indicator. Now the, we, we, everyone's probably heard about uh, it has two new uh, genuine uh, system wide gestures where you stroke up uh, from the bottom of it to get at a new hardware panel. You stroke down from the top to get indicators as a way to remind you, however, that hey, look, there's something new you can you can uh, swipe upward from. They put an up arrow up there but now when you at, at first when you try to unlock it's li it's like it's trying to tell you swipe up to unlock when actually you have to actually do like a hellraiser puzzle box sort of thing i it always took me like three swipes to get through that and now they've actually put the arrow where it's supposed to be uh, mike have you, mike have you had a chance to play with ios 7 yet in your travels yeah and one of the things that i'm really excited about that I just am utterly fascinated with, and it's one of the things that made the iPad, well, the iPhone, first of all, but the iPad later so compelling is the natural reactions that the that the interface gives you when you interact with it, when you touch things, scroll, and the physics and all that kind of stuff. And iOS 7 has just gone completely um, over the top in a good way with ways in which the interface subtly reacts to whatever it is you're doing. So for example, you look at the phone buttons and you dial the phone. It's not just like, you know, you're dialing the phone. The second you touch it, you know, they're empty. The second you touch it, boom, it's gray. And then when you let go, it sort of fades, fades away. It's a small, subtle user interface convention. And that's just one small example of many that, that exist in this in this operating system, but it just feels really good to use because it always responds to what you do in an appealing way. Not always appealing, but it always responds. And there's all kinds of really neat little things like that. They're, they're unmeasurable. They are slammed by critics as fluff and, and, and sort of decorative elements or whatever. But in fact, they're, that's the, those are the kinds of things that make a user interface compelling to use and even addictive uh, to use because they're constantly giving kind of feedback to your brain that the real 3D world gives you. Um, because every time you touch something in the real world, there's an effect, there's a cause and effect. And so it's really uh, beautiful in that respect. Um, um, uh, uh, not only within the uh, general use of the operating system, but uh, within the apps that Apple has created. So it's just really, uh, I, I really like it. For example, there's a really interesting thing where you have two speeds on certain interfaces. So when you're looking at, you know, you go into the mode where you're looking at multiple apps and you want to scroll through the running apps, 
if you scroll through the top, that's the super fast speed, and you scroll through the bottom, it moves slower. It's like a two-speed bicycle. Really pleasant to use, and I think a lot of people are going to love it, and they probably won't know exactly why they love it so much, but I think it's really, this is a real crowd-pleasing interface. Yeah. This, this really isn't a case of Apple just changing the drapes and the carpet. They This is their first chance to take this thing that they built in 2007 uh, and decide what parts of this interface were okay for 2007, but it turns out we don't need them. What parts of the interface, what, what parts of mobile interfaces have we seen other app developers create in the past five years that, wow, that actually is a good idea. We should probably put that into our operating system. It, re it really does feel like, it's, it's, not, it's more like a facelift. It really is like, okay, now here, here we are preparing the uh, preparing iOS for the next five years, not just hoping to make it compete with whatever else is out there right now. I mean, for, for one, what my, one of my favorite user facing features is now the new app switcher, which is it maybe, maybe it's a little bit fatalistic. The old, the old way of uh, getting the jiggling icons, and then closing them out seemed to indicate that you would never, ever, 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 ever need to manually shut down an app so okay i suppose if you want to we'll let you do this do this top secret thing now it seems like well yes we will let you we will let you yeah. simply have an application switcher that lets you flick applications away and, and get rid of them uh it's yeah. I, I could really spend uh, like so many hours, you know, in my in my reading chair next to a fireplace with a brand, snifty, <laughs> snifter of brander, brandy trying to figure out, is this a shift in Apple's attitude that perhaps users should have more control over what they do? Uh, so it's, yeah. You're, there's you're, more, you're there's more multitasking APIs, Andy. So the chances of, you know, them needing to do it might be higher now too. <laughs> Let, that's a good point because not only like Steve's absolutely right. It, it's so much. It's a much prettier and much more natural interface. Even though will even if it will take people a little while to relearn things they already know, but it's chock full of so many APIs. I, I can't tell you how many times over the summer I've spoken to developers who have said there's so many things I would have liked to have done over the past three, four, five years, but that I couldn't do because they would have been too difficult. And now I feel like I've been enabled to do some new stuff. Like that's have you have you had those sort of, those sort of conversations too? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, as much as we saw the the visual refresh and we heard a lot of people complaining about icons, every developer I spoke with at WWDC, and I w I wanted to make sure I spoke to a lot of them before I wrote anything about iOS seven because it it looked more than it was just on the surface. The new multitasking yeah. stuff is phenomenal because it makes every app a first class citizen. And the really smart thing is that Apple realize that perception is reality and they have this concept of just-in-time updates. So you don't really need to have all these applications running all the time. They just need to run right before you need to use them. And from push... Uh, push triggers so a notification can update an app to Apple watching when you use apps and just temporally updating them, you know, five minutes before you usually open them to um, timers that developers can set. They've put this entire framework together where, you know, if you're not looking behind the curtains, the stuff just works for you. And I thought there'd be pushback from developers because usually they want to control all their own stuff. But Apple used language that made it seem like they were doing a huge amount of server side smarts. Uh, behind the scenes. And that's the kind of stuff that really appeals to developers and I think made it likely that they would go and implement all these features. And just the apps you're starting to see now with, you know, with content or messaging that can provide you this. Previously, you'd get a push notification, you tap it, you'd go to Twitter or something and then have to wait five seconds for it to go and fetch your message. And now that notification goes and prefetches your message. And it seems like a small difference, but those little, those little things are going to make the overall experience so much better, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the the real proof in iOS 7 is not going to be what we see tomorrow, but what we see a few months from now when all the developers are really up to speed on what's going on. Uh, do, do, I want to ask, I want to ask something of, of Tanya too. I mean, have, have you been working hard in iOS 7, and has that been a stumbling block to you trying to get any of this work done? I, I've I've been. I'll, I'll let me preface this by saying that I have had iOS 7 on a couple of devices that are in no way mission critical that I can put down and walk away from and stay away from for a week if I get upset with what I've seen? Well, um, I have installed uh, iOS 7 on my regular iPhone that I use just for normal person iPhone stuff and been living with it for a while now. And haven't had any any you know huge huge struggles with, with getting used to it. I um, I 
I would say that I've spent less time, you know, sort of marveling over the parallax effect or, um, you know, getting excited about the small interface details, which are nice. I think I've I've been much more like, okay, you know, how do I send a text message on this thing? Or, you know, just how how do I get my normal stuff working? And I think that's probably also because of the focus of my job, which is to help other people figure out how to get their thing working. And I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings about some of the helpfulness of iOS 7. Um, when you read about you know, Apple's claims for what it's going to do with, you know, downloading your apps automatically in the background for you and figuring out what you want to read before you even wake up in the morning and knowing when you're going to wake up and downloading everything for you. It sounds fabulous. But I always worry when, you know, some kind of computing device is going to do stuff for you, you, you're hoping that it will guess right about what you want it to do. And so hopefully with all the new processors and new smarts in Apple, this will come true. But I think, you know, in three months, we will know a whole lot more, not only about what cool stuff we're going to be able to do, but also if it fully lives up to expectations. Yeah. Does it, does it feel to anybody as though there's anything that's, that, that's missing? Because this is, again, Apple's first chance to explicitly say, everybody, you're going to have to relearn some things. This is going to be a, a, a we're, we're putting you on an uphill grade for, for a month. It seems like this is the time when if you're going to disrupt, you're going to may as well put in whatever you can. Uh, it's actually a uh, side note. I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, the last, according again, according to published sources, uh, there is, uh, they, the last build does not have uh, iCloud che- keychains in it. That was the feature where your passwords are going to be synced across all devices everywhere, which is, which was, one of the features that in the WWDC keynote was given a little that actual spotlight as though it was a really, really important feature. So that's Gishfinkto. That's not there anymore. I think that's uh, but, waiting for Mavericks so that you can do it on both platforms at once. Okay. Hopefully. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it is a big deal. I mean, when we talk about passwords, every time there's a deletion of that, you wonder, okay, do they not have faith in this? Or is this, or is this as you say, just trying to sync across other devices? Uh, but but, but uh, for, what, what, is, what opportunities has Apple missed or do they already have a full plate as it is? Uh, Well, I mean, for me, Andy, like we've talked about this before, actionable notifications is like they're doing it on OS 10 Mavericks. They're not doing it on iOS. And because iOS 7 is such a dynamic, like they're basically, they're basically birthing dynamic operating systems with iOS 7. And one of the key features is their ability to push interface. It's no longer stuck in an app or stuck on a home screen. Um, And one of the best features of push interface is actionable notifications. So if you get a text message and you're playing... Uh, Plants vs. Zombies 2, you don't have to leave the game, go to messages, write your message, come back. You can just answer it during the game, send it back and be on your way or reset alarms or do any of a bunch of other stuff. And that going, that's available on Android. It was partially available on WebOS years ago. It's going to be in Mavericks, but it's still not going to be in iOS. And I think that's still that and maybe the, the predictive aspect of Google Now are the two things that seem the most obvious to me. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's what I was oh, just going to say. Is you know, the, I think I, I I would have guessed that Siri would be further along by now. Now Siri is greatly improved in this in terms of the chattiness and real life human sounding voice and all that kind of stuff. But I would think that you know the sort of preemptive stuff that Google now does uh, is just gold. I mean, it's just such great stuff. And you can't do the same things on on I, on the iOS version that you can on the Android version. And I would think that Apple would really want to get busy on that aspect of it. I'd like Siri to start interrupting me uh, at some point out of the blue with something that, you know, she sort of came up with and put two and two together. The traffic is bad. And I noticed that, uh, you know, you have a meeting. So, uh, you know, I know you like to go to Starbucks and uh, I know that Starbucks is really busy. right? I mean, I'm sort of projecting in the future, but I'd like to see a lot more sort of you know, super assistant kind of stuff rather than just, uh, you know, tweaking it a little bit and making the voice sound nicer. It's on the yeah, Today I mean, screen. There's one little bit of it. If you go to the Today screen, it'll say, if you want to leave for home now, it'll take you 12 minutes given traffic conditions. Or if you go to work yeah. a lot, it'll say, if you want to leave for work today. But it's only that one line of text on that one screen. <laughs> two two yeah. years ago, some restaurant reservations with Siri. And, and like, I, by now, I'd, 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 like, I'd like Siri to say, hey, you know, your wedding anniversary is coming up in, in three days. I see that you haven't ordered any flowers. Would you like me to take care of that for you? <laughs> now, I want that. My wife wouldn't want that, but I, I want that. 
and and that sort of thing where it's just like really preemptive and really ass covering you know it's really <laughs> save your bacon type stuff see that 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 does create a problem though because what happens if you suddenly switch phones and suddenly you become the you're no longer a thoughtful husband you no longer remember birthdays and anniversaries <laughs> you no longer know what her what her what her dress size is that that could cause problems down line that's what that's all i'm saying yeah, or the, or the, if there's a glitch and you know there's an error and I'm I get my f the flowers myself. And why <laughs> why do I get flowers from myself? I, oh my god! So let, let, let's get bad. to let's get to a critical question though. Um, I'm ninety nine percent sure that I'm going to upgrade both my. Okay, gr granted, I'm now a, a full time Android user, but I also use my iPhone a lot. But I rely on my iPad for my daily work. And side note, I do think that the interface for iOS 7 looks a little bit, too, it still looks a little bit strange for me on the phone, pretty much because it's so different. On the iPad, though, boy, with a little bit extra room to spread out in, it looks so much prettier and so much more more right and more correct. So, but nonetheless, it, it means something that I'm probably going to be upgrading my iPad to iOS 7. But... I'm not sure that I would recommend it to other people. So I really want to go around the panel and get your opinions on, tell me, are you going to be upgrading your, your, your real use devices? And two, will you recommend that random person who does not work in the tech industry would uh, do it? And let's start with Renee, I think. So I, I have this test that I do right before any iOS release because I put the first beta on both my iPhone and iPad immediately because I have to. I mean, it's just it's part of my yeah. job. So what I do is I wait till the GM is out and then I give in this case, I gave my iPad to my mom. My mom's favorite computer, her like the computer she uses the most is the iPad. She can do way more on an iPad than she can do on her Mac. Uh, it's the perfect computing device for her. So I gave it to her and I wanted to kind of gauge her reaction. And she loved it immediately. She thought it was colorful and playful and she had no trouble doing anything that she normally normally does on an iPad. And to me, that means that um, for most people, most of the time, this update will be, you know, maybe a little bit jarring initially, but it'll be absolutely usable enough for them to do. If you have something that's mission critical, if, you know, like Andy, you you absolutely have to have it for that plane flight, I would wait a week and see what, you know, the reaction are. But I think for most people, it's fairly safe at this point. Mm. How about you, Tanya? Oh, I absolutely recommend if your hardware device will support iOS 7, absolutely upgrade. Um, there's just no reason not to. It It's a benefit to everybody to, to stay current with what Apple is doing and to be part of the excitement of what's going on with the technology. The only consideration really would be you know, do not upgrade, you know, two hours before you're planning to get on an airplane or, <laughs> you know, don't upgrade if you really need to be using a lot of your apps and you don't have a few hours to sit down with it to learn what's going on. You know, take take a couple days when you can, you know, focus on your upgrade to make sure that you're ready, you're ready for it and everything's going smoothly for you. But this this is just really neat. I mean, these these iPhones and iPads, these, these things that we have, these are like having supercomputers in your pocket. And I have seen all kinds of people who are not very computer literate do the most amazing things with them with the, using the maps and the social networking and the geofencing, just all the features they have. Everybody finds a few features that are just like little miracles that they carry around with them every day. And if we're, you know, alive at this time in history, why not? If you've got a device, put on the newest thing from Apple and try out all the great stuff. I, I think everybody will find something to like. Yeah, there'll be a couple little stumbling blocks. A couple of things won't look the way they used to, but it's good for everyone's brains to learn new things. And I, I think this is a win this is a winner from Apple and there's just no reason to stick around on iOS 6. Things will start breaking or not syncing correctly and you want to get updated and, and stay with the program and have a good time with it. Mike, how about you? I mean, you're, you're, you're maybe in an otter situation because... Yeah, I totally agree with it. You know, he yeah, I mean, human psychology is a funny thing. There's always grousing, and then when people get used to it, they they still think that they they don't they don't like something about it. But then try to get them to go back to the old thing. It's always better. Uh, the new thing is going to be fantastic for all users. I personally am like you. I use the uh, iPhone as a secondary phone, uh, and I use the iPad heavily as a as a very primary device outside of MacBook Pro with the Retina um, as a 
an, another primary device. But yeah, I'm going to upgrade and recommend that everybody upgrade as soon as possible. Hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I agree with you mostly. The only the I think the the only qualm that I have is that uh, I, I think it's going to be stable. I think that most of the apps that people rely on are the kind of apps that have a huge uh, huge tech support and huge uh, huge support staff working on them. It's not one one person in a in a kitchen counter who doesn't have time to really update something for iOS seven. So I think that it's been tested uh, ten ways till Sunday by now. Uh, even third party apps. I think the big hitch for a lot of people might be that. A lot of what we use, particularly a phone for, is I've got 10 seconds to make something happen. Like I'm, uh, for instance, on, on, on Tuesday, I'm going to be recording an interview that is the sort of thing where if that thing gets screwed up, I just have to leave the business. That's how, ba that's how bad it would be. And for that, I don't think I will be having iOS 7 on the device that's doing that recording. Uh, so I, I think that people need to be prepared that things that you expect them to be up in a certain place might not be in that certain place. A way to do something that you've been doing almost by muscle memory at this point might work a different way. So I think that your phone will be stable, but the person behind it might not be stable uh, for, for at least for the first few days. So <laughs> definitely keep that in mind. Um, so, so definitely users. Thumbs, yes. <laughs> thumbs up around the, around the panel for uh, updating to iOS 7 on the first day. Um, before we leave iOS 7, there's uh, another uh, one of the, Keen, one of the really coolest things about iOS 7 is support for a new thing that Apple is doing called iBeacons, which is uh, there's – imagine these incredibly low-power Bluetooth devices, kind of like smoke detectors where you put a little battery in it and it'll run for an entire year that can broadcast, here is – I'm an iBeacon, here is my location, here is my address. And so it can do things like – pinpoint your location inside a building, inside a specific room, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, this is first spotted as an unremarked little like six point piece of type on that master slide at WWDC of, and here are all the other features that we're going to be putting into iOS 7. Uh, but they've been, Apple's been talking about it a lot uh, since then. Um, what I, what I found interesting is that a lot of, uh, a lot of the commentary online about iBeacons has been that this is going to be an NFC killer. That well, why should you have to tap a device to a to a tag uh, that you've put onto a door jam in order to find out where you are? See, this is a NFC is a failure and it's uh, it's failed for e-commerce. It's it's going to be killed by eye beacons with these little twenty or thirty dollar devices that stores and houses can put uh, put up pretty much anywhere. I'm not sure it's going to be that big. I mean, it's it's an interesting resource. I just am waiting to see how people are gonna actually implement this in buildings and public spaces inside their homes. Like is like. Uh, uh, Renee, have, have you have you heard from people who are really excited about making products that support iBeacons yet? Uh, you know, I haven't. I think it hasn't gotten the amount of attention. I mean, Apple hasn't given it a lot of attention yet. Maybe they're working behind the scenes, but it hasn't been featured prominently. I'm kind of with you on the NFC thing, but I think one of the problems in tech media is that we we look at chipsets and not feature sets. You know, Apple's never been a company that says, oh, look, here's an NFC radio. What can what features can we throw on it? They're more likely to say this is a feature set we want. Do we need an NFC radio to do it or can we use Bluetooth low energy or ad hoc Wi-Fi direct? Um, and so far, they've been going with Bluetooth low energy and, and Wi-Fi direct. And I think that's that's great. It remains to be seen what becomes really popular because if any, you know, if, if a major retailer rolls out NFC and the iPhone can't do it, that's a problem. If iBeacons take over the world and nobody needs NFC, then it doesn't matter very much. But I like the fact that we're doing all these location-based technologies and not just from satellites and GPS, but these kinds of things, for example, you could put this in a national park and people who have accessibility issues could do tours that they were never able to do before. And when you watch those WWDC videos, Tim Cook's really fond of showing off, you know, how these technologies matter to people in everyday life. And that's the thing I'm going to look most forward to in seeing with iBeacons. Yeah, I th I'm really bullish about this thing because, you know, I think it's just incredible. And I, I wrote something, I, I don't know, a year or two ago uh, about uh, how I suspected Apple uh, wanted to make commerce work like it does in an Apple store where, you know, you go to the Apple store, there's no cash register. There's no standing in line to buy your, you know, your, your new plastic, uh, fruity colored, uh, iPhone case. You just, uh, you just find somebody with the right kind of t-shirt and you sort of accost them and say, you want, you want to buy it. And they, they swipe a credit card, which is a little barbaric. Um, and, and then you, you, you walk out with a, with a, with a, 
receipt in your e inbox, right, email inbox. And, and I think they've sort of envisioned that's how all brick and mortar commerce ought to work. And iBeacons is one way to do that. The other thing that's interesting about iBeacons is right now we have stuff like uh, Foursquare and, you know, er, er, all of its copycat stuff. And, you know, where you go and you check in, you know, I'm at, I'm at Dunkin Donuts and I'm checking in. And the reason that check-ins is kind of a required for the, for the retailers and for the, you know, the, the people who would serve us, you know, all the stuff that goes around check-ins is because they don't know exactly, they don't know where Dunkin Donuts, Dunkin Donuts, you go to check in at Dunkin Donuts and it's like, well, here's a list of places where you might be. And then the sixth item down the list, oh, there's Dunkin Donuts, that's why I am. And you check in and you, okay, you, now you were at Dunkin Donuts. With iBeacons, there's no check. You don't have to check in. Like they, they know you're exactly what store you're in. If you, you know, again, this is going to be an opt out thing. There's no need to, you know, it's not an especially egregious privacy issue beyond the the, the long list that we already have to deal with. But 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 is but but that's one of the things about iBeacons. There's certainty about where you are. Not only that you're at Dunkin' Donuts, but you're looking at the you're looking at the bear claws. I mean, you, it can be pretty specific about you know you can triangulate these things at a microscopic level. You put one over here and one over there. And Apple also uh, um, uh, recently acquired another company. Um, name of it is escaping me for the sec for the moment. But um, what that company does that they acquire triangulates both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals to get a very exact location indoors. And so they're you know they're gonna uh, let me say it's called uh, Wi-Fi Slam. Um, and so they're going to be able to enable retailers to put you know. Even a gigantic store can put three or four of these things uh, or, or maybe two of these things plus a Wi-Fi network and really know, you know, pretty exactly where you are in the store and give you very good context uh, for stuff. And then it's all through Bluetooth 4.0. And that's the genius of all this is, is Bluetooth low energy. So, you know, Apple's essentially what Apple's doing is sort of leapfrogging the NFC thing. We've been waiting for NFC chips. When is the iPhone going to have an NFC chip? When are the, this phone, that phone, the other phone going to have an NFC chip? The second uh, this stuff exists, it's compatible with everything back to the iPhone 4S. And it's, and it's also, by the way, compatible with the iPad. It's compatible with all the Apple laptops. Apple is the first company to ever put Bluetooth low energy into a laptop or into a phone. And so there are literally, by the time that they throw the switch and make this real, there's going to be a couple hundred million people who are good to go with this technology. No waiting for a chip, no, no, nothing. So it's it's really, uh, I think the, the potential here, and there's no guarantee that Apple will realize the potential, but the potential is absolutely enormous. It is, it, it is a sufficiently big deal. Uh, Apple, as far as I know, and I, it's possible that my ear hasn't been close enough to the ground, they haven't talked a whole lot about the openness of the technology. I guess I'd be a, a lot more excited. I'm excited about what it can do, especially the idea of uh, being so low power, running so long on one battery and so inexpensive to produce that you may as well put, you know, put them uh, in any place that would be useful. But what worries me is that every time they come up with use examples as well, if you have your iPhone and then you have your iPad and then you have your other Apple device, you have this other Apple device, I'd feel a little bit more, I'd feel a little bit better about it if we knew that Apple was going to make this into an open standard, if they were possible for any device that, uh, that uh, supports Bluetooth low energy can take advantage of this. Otherwise... It's like that golden escalator inside the mall that takes you to the real store that the <laughs> riffraff can't access. And I mean, if you're if accessibility <laughs> is a great is a great goal for everybody, but if they were really interested in that, they would say, you know, we think this is a great idea. We don't think other companies have pushed this before the way that it's going to work. So we've come up with our own standard. You can we're, we're publishing them, and if you want to create software for any device that will allow uh, someone to navigate through uh, through Forest Trail or, or or park easily, we're going to let you do that. So that's I wish I'd seen more stuff from Apple saying here's we're not going to just make this an Apple only party. We're going to make this available to everybody because NFC, it's, again, open pool. Anybody can come in, come in there. Yeah, yeah and that the, is really the question. Yeah. That's the, how open is it going to be? And there are other third party companies that are proceeding as if it's going to be open. For example, Estimote, uh, which is, you know, already selling what they're claiming are. I think they're I think they're claiming that they're iBeacons compatible uh, devices they're selling three for ninety nine dollars, which is an amazingly yeah. cheap price. There's another company that's out there leasing them for a, a monthly fee of like ten dollars or something like that. And so it's really, I mean, it's really the the, the thing that the actual beacon does is so trivial uh, that it really has got to be open. And you know, if you're in a if you're serious about an e commerce uh, situation, 
you know, it's, it would really be dumb to have entire systems set up just for people that use one particular brand of phone. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something else that got me excited about uh, the technology, not necessarily having these 20 and $30 devices that you can buy and stick around places, but what if Apple simply decided that we can do this so well and we believe it so, so, so much that every Apple TV will also have iBeacon chips in it. Every router we make will also have iBeacon in it so that without even having <laughs> to set up an extra network, if you enable a certain feature in your phone, it can your phone can know that, oh, well, Andy's in the living room now. I'm going to just def by default connect through the AirPlay speakers that I know happen to be inside this living room. Or I know that a Andy has left the house because I can see that he's at the front door and the last place he was was at the room that was behind the front door. So I'm going to put the phone into whatever mode he wants it to be in when he is not home anymore. I'm going to turn on, I'm going to disconnect the, the Wi-Fi from, uh, 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 from the home network. I'm going to make sure it doesn't necessarily automatically connect to... Uh, base stations that it might encounter while he's on his walk, that sort of stuff. I mean, this it's. I think that I, I see sort of a similarity between the response to iBeacons and NFC in that when people talk about iBeacons, they talk about that store experience where, hi, great, I've, I just, you know, Pottery Barn, the reason why I stopped at this, at this, this set of placemats is because I got a text message. I'm not interested in these placemats. Please don't record that Andy Anatko is shopping for placemats and market at me accordingly. Uh, but NFC is usually talked about as a failed way of doing e-commerce, of doing wallets. And to me, every the most impressive stuff I've seen with NFC is when you you need to configure your phone or your tablet to work with this router or with this speaker system, and you simply tap it against the router, and they have a conversation chip to chip, and suddenly your phone can talk to the router without any complications like that. So all of these things have a lot of potential. I think it's going to take a company that has enough force of will to say, this is a great idea. and We're going to make everybody believe that this is as good as we think it is. Yeah. Uh, any, any, any last comments about iOS 7 before we go to break? No. Okay. Uh, let's, 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 we have uh, now before Leo uh, fled for his directing assignment, he did uh, pre-record a bunch of, a uh, bunch of uh, ads for some of our sponsors. So now let's go to Leo Laporte somewhere in the recent past to talk about legal zoom. Hey, Andy, sorry to interrupt. Thank you, by the way, for filling in while I'm gone. <sighs> First day on my vacation, I'm already back doing ads. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about LegalZoom. One of the reasons I like to do the ads for LegalZoom is because I use LegalZoom. I used it when I first set up Twit. Uh, somebody, I think it was Kevin Rose, said you should really make an LLC when you do this. And he'd set up a number of companies, Dig and others. Uh, so I listened to Kevin and I went to LegalZoom.com. Now, LegalZoom is not a law firm. This is what's cool about it. It doesn't cost you like a law firm will. They don't bill you $350 an hour. The way it works, you go to LegalZoom, you're going to get a flat rate for a particular product. For instance, in this case, an LLC. Uh, you can also do an S-Corp or a C-Corp if you want to incorporate as well. But you can do other things too. Uh, you Trademarks, lot, patent of filings, all the things you might want to do when you're starting a business. It's really wonderful. I got to tell you, starting your own business is awesome. But it's really important to legally protect yourself. The good news is it doesn't have to cost a mint. You don't have to go out and get venture funding just to, just to do the LLC. Over the past 12 years, a million business owners have trusted LegalZoom to help start their businesses, including me. LegalZoom saves you a lot of time and a pile of money. Mostly, you know, an LLC filing is basically filling out forms. So LegalZoom gives you those self-help services. They go through this step-by-step questions that you need to answer occasionally you run up against something you might want some help they also have and i love this uh the legal zoom a legal plan which lets you talk to an attorney at a pre-negotiated flat rate you choose the attorney in your state from a list of attorneys you've got profiles unedited reviews from users so you can really choose the attorney that's right for you you know exactly how much it's going to cost you can ask them for instance delaware california where would be the best place to set my uh, llc up Go to Illegal Zoom today to see what's right for you. Form an LLC, get a DBA, incorporate, form a nonprofit. That all is $99, including the filing fee. Added, add the filing fees, not including the filing fees. Uh, they also do stuff for personal wills, trusts, LLCs, trademarks. So here's the deal. If you uh, are going to use Legal Zoom, I just ask that you use MBW in the referral box at checkout. We're going to give you 10 bucks off. Legal Zoom will know that you saw this on Mac Break Weekly. LegalZoom.com. $10 off when you use MBW as the offer code. Back to Mac Break Weekly, Andy. Thank you, Leo. I, I, I 
I didn't see that ad beforehand, but I did notice that. The, so the last thing we talked about was NFC. And if you notice over his shirt pocket, he was wearing an NFC chip <laughs> that unlocks his Moto X phone. Um, Apple maybe has a better solution for getting past the unlock phone pain with the uh, iPhone 5S. Uh, all the, uh, the 5S and the uh, 5C announced last week they're shipping on Friday. So here's, here's another place where... We have a solemn duty and a responsibility as tech-savvy people and people who are interested in such things to people who may have been camped out for at least 12 hours in front of their local AT&T store by now, waiting to be the first to have an, a 5S. Okay, look, side note, if you're camping out, that was so 2007. That's It's done. You don't have they, – they make plenty. And, and, and you know what? If they, if they sell out in September, good chance they're going to make more. You know what? If they stop making iPhones, I will – I will give you fifty dollars. Like if, if they if they only make that one first run, I will give you fifty dollars. I I'm I'm that confident that they'll they'll have more in, in October, November. Um, but I, I we we probably all gotten those uh, emails from people who are their contracts are up. They've been waiting, or they bought an iPhone five and they're thinking about buying out of their contracts. Um, I was not. I, I was actually at the event uh, last week, so I wasn't participating in uh, the show last week, but. What what were people's impressions, and not just in terms of hey, cool technology, but is this really the the the, the ooh ah phone? Uh, for, it is it is an S, you know, it is a it, S release or a tick or, or a talk update. But I was pretty darn impressed. I mean, that's that the A7 processor inside there. It's kind of it's kind of like uh, the advantages of iOS seven. It's not so much what's there today, so much as sitting back again, <laughs> leather chair fireplace, snifter yeah. brandy, thinking about all the things that Apple and developers can do with hardware like this. So what? how, how impressed were people about this? And we'll start with Renee here. You, you, you know, I, I think you're exactly right. I think the A7 processor, which is 64 uh, bit, but also has a lot of other technologies. It's based on ARM V8, which is a much better instruction set. It's probably got a PowerVR Series 6 um, GPU inside of it. It's it's an amazing processor, and we probably won't see the results of that immediately, but what it shows, what importance about where Apple's going with mobile is really exciting. And uh, to give you an idea of it, the fingerprint scanner, which is going to be the big Santa Claus commercial moment, depends entirely on the A7 processor and a secure enclave that lets it talk at a hardware level to maintain um, security for that entire fingerprint authentication process, which you kind of really need to do to employ something like that at a functional mainstream level. If you look at the outside, yes, it comes in gold and space gray now. But when you look at the camera improvements, you know, once again, Apple's putting the focus on the image signal processor, not just on the glass on the outside. And when you look up at how many pawns they've been putting on the board for the last you know, a couple of years as they start to encroach towards the center, towards what it looks like their mobile end game is, I think it's really exciting. I mean, if you have an iPhone 5, there's very little reason for you to upgrade unless you happen to need one of the new LTE bands they support. But if you have older iPhones, especially if you have one not getting iOS 7 and won't be able to run iOS 7 apps, both the 5C and the 5S are tremendously exciting phones. Yeah, the, the the more I dig into these things, uh, the, the M7 processor that's ju that does nothing but try to understand, look at the read the accelerometers, read all the sensor data to figure out where are you, what are you doing with your phone right now, and is there a way that the phone can adjust itself to be not annoying you while you're out taking a walk versus when you're inside your car versus when the car you're inside the car but the car is parked versus you're inside your house. It just seems like this is going to be a whole new d game that we're dealing with. Or you're next asleep. Year. I mean, they, they said it'll, it will stop using network connectivity when it detects it's not moving and it thinks you're asleep. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, how, how are we even how are we even going to do battery tests on this? Because the the usual thing is just to beat the hell out of it for until the the, the damn thing gives up and, and begs for mercy. Just keep keep hammering the Wi-Fi, keep hammering the uh, uh, running running video, keep playing games, keep I'm running. I'm putting uh, 3D uh, Brian Klug on a treadmill. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's good to that it seems more like more like an intern sort of thing you know they're, they're <laughs> developing valuable job training experience by running at seven miles an hour until either the phone dies or the intern does uh, <laughs> uh but it, it really is that that kind of thing isn't it i mean uh, mike were you impressed with what you saw yeah absolutely and 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 i like to um write a lot about the uh, the the user side of technology and so i like to parse these things that uh, so, for example, for the individual user, probably the best single thing about it will be the camera. I have a strong, yeah. I mean, the camera in the iPhone 5 was already just killer. And people always say, well, this one's better, that one's better. 
No, the iPhone five has the best camera out there today. That'll change tomorrow. Yeah, I disagree, um, but... And you know, th there are some cameras that do a little bit better on the high end. Some in I'll do a little bit better in, you know, the HTC one is a little bit better in darker rooms, but iPhone is the camera that does second best in both of those, which makes it the best camera. Anyway, so the, the new camera is going to be great. That's going to be great for the user. Um, but the only, and, and all the, the 64 bits and the faster processor and all that kind of stuff, but the only thing that's really culture changing is the fingerprint uh, reader because, and people are, people are sort of missing, a lot of people are missing the boat on what this thing is for. It's not about securing the phone. It's not a passcode replacement. It's about identifying the user. It, it turns the iPhone into a driver's license and a signature and, and, and it turns it into potentially into a password uh, keeper type thing, a last pass type of thing. It turns it into the sort of NFC thing that, that authenticates you into your building. And it's something, you know, a phone is something everybody has. So every, many, many phones, uh, I say many, maybe a, maybe a dozen significant memorable phones in the last five, six, seven years have tried to put fingerprint readers in, sometimes awkwardly on the back. They've always slapped them on as some way to, to replace a passcode or password or something like that. They've all failed miserably. They all looked horrible. They were, there was nothing good about them. You know, Motorola came out with one um, a few years ago, and then in the second version of that phone, it didn't have one because they said, yeah, nobody uses it. That's what Apple does. That's what Apple does better than any other company, and, and, and it, there's no contest, which is that they change human behavior, they change culture. And so they're gonna get, they're gonna make the world safe for, and, and give a reason for fingerprint ID to exist on a phone. This is really going to change things. Finally, we've been talking about digital wallets that replace your physical wallet. We all carry physical wallets still. 2013, and we're still carrying around cow skin filled with plastic, like magnetic, you know, it's a bizarre. We go to a restaurant and we hand our credit card over to somebody who takes it out of our sight into the back room where there are who knows who's back there. And 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 we get to, re, you know, if this all goes as, as I think it will, we get to replace all that. So it's really, that's really a culture changing uh, thing. And I'm predicting that it's going to have enormous usage. I think that they're, they're actually going to succeed. And they're, you know, just like they did with the multi-touch user interface on a phone, every other phone is going to do it. And then those users are going to use it as well. I think they're really going to change the world with this thing. Mm. I, I was really impressed in the demo room by how well it worked. Uh, in previous weeks, we've talked about uh, the fingerprint reader and what would be expected of it, that that it really does have to work 100% of the time because if it's only about 75%, people are just not going to really rely on it because why why roll the dice every time? But I had five, only about five or 10 minutes to try the fingerprint scanning, but you get it registering a, a fingerprint is really easy. It's very, very graphical. It's not a technical process. It's a, it's a, almost a game uh, process that, uh, that it works like. And yeah. Dan thing's reliable. I mean, I, I registered one thumb. I could not get it to work with any other finger. Uh, yeah. and, and the one that I registered didn't matter whether I was using the tip, the sides, the, the, the fat end, the whatever end, uh, obviously we're all going to be testing this out pretty heavily on Friday when we get our hardware, but I, if if in, in the in the worst possible scenario, a brand new user who whom the phone had never seen before and who has never used this service before, if it worked that well, that's extremely promising. Well, what you know, do you think if, to, go ahead. Sorry, if, go ahead. if I could just uh, just a, another quick brief thing about this, um, and you're absolutely right. And every time you do use it, the fingerprint gets more. It, it gets smarter about knowing, recognizing your fingerprint. It gets more accurate. Um, the other part of it is the genius uh, the, that Apple is doing where they're using it for two things. They're using it to unlock the phone and they're using it for um, Apple, you know, online Apple store iTunes purchases to, to replace that password, which is really three things. They're using it as a password replacement. They're using it as a, uh, a an authenticated ID user for you to use a credit card to buy something. And they're using it to unlock the phone. That is so genius because you it's, everybody's annoyed by having to put in the password yet again because I downloaded another app. And it's like something we, we all do all the time. And they, now it's, it'll just, whoosh, that thing will sail through. You'll easy pass those apps now. And that's you're just one baby step away from saying, okay, well, you now you can buy everything that way. Companies, you know, Macy's and all these other companies just work with us, Apple, 
and and the credit card that we already have on file for this user, they can buy stuff at your store now. They already know how to do it. They already feel comfortable doing it. I mean, it's just really, uh, it, it's just genius to roll it out in such a limited way that covers the basic things that they then can be extended to all passwords, all commerce, if they want to, if if they if they decide that they're going to go that route, which I think they very well could. Yeah. I, I want to I give Tanya a chance to chime in. Uh, what, what do you think about it? Well, I personally was just so excited when I first heard about it. And that's just because personally, I spend a lot of time editing and writing about uh, iOS. And therefore, on my own desk and in my own office, I am constantly entering passwords on these things. And further, I keep editing articles and books about how important security is and online privacy and things like that. And so I become more and more personally paranoid. So over the past three years, I've gone from, you know, having the stupidest passcodes you could possibly imagine on these things to actually having fancier and fancier ones that take longer and longer to enter. So I... I will be getting that iPhone 5S just as fast as I possibly can, just because <laughs> I'm excited about the new feature. Implementation details, we still don't know too much about them, but I think for your typical user, what this means is, and let's just assume that Apple's hardware lives up to its usual reputation and works well. So for the typical user, this means that they can stick their thumb or whatever the finger they want on their iPhone and unlock it without worrying that if they just leave it out in a restaurant or lose it on a bus, that some, you know, miscreant is going to unlock it. And what that means is that they can be less secure within the apps on the phone. So for instance, in Safari, they may be more likely to, you know, turn on the autofill so they can more easily log into websites. Or they may just be less circumspect about what apps they have on their phone. For example, when I traveled to Europe last summer, there are a few apps I have that sync to a lot of my personal information and business information. I just took them off. I'm like, you know, if I lose the phone, I'm on vacation. I don't want to worry about someone figuring out that I've got, you know, an account on this particular system. It's just not taking the app off the phone. So some of those worries just go away, assuming that it works. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Apple has not really clarified from what I understand among the Tippet staffers this morning, they, they just haven't really clarified it, is how will this uh, fingerprint scanner system interact with the uh, new iCloud keychain that we're hoping we'll see back in iOS 7 soon, possibly when Mavericks comes out? And uh, to what extent will uh, your fingerprint let you into anything you've got synced in your iCloud keychain which will let you access uh, web passwords, web logins in Safari. So that is a big question. And, but I, I'm just very excited about it. And the other thing I like about it is it's sort of Apple acknowledging what I think is a huge complaint among users. Users don't like entering passwords. They don't like remembering them. They don't like typing them. They don't like retyping them. They don't like the fact that they have to have numbers and special characters and wacky stuff, especially when you're typing that on a small keyboard. And by Apple sort of saying, hey, we get it. This is a huge pain. We're at least trying to put in a feature that makes sense here. It, it's just acknowledging to the user of, of, of something that is not working very well and that it sort of feels caring on Apple's part to put something in that hopefully will, experience, will improve the everyday user experience. Mm. That's a great observation. Didn't occur to me that if, they, if you trust, the, if you trust the, the walls and the door and the lock that you've just passed through once you're inside that area you can feel a little bit you can you, you you can sort of like you know take off your pants and walk around with, without worrying about you know about being a little bit more casual about uh, about where you are if you feel as though that's a very very secure secure zone apple that, does that's seem, an interesting analogy i like it i well, i am a communicator uh <laughs> <laughs> the, well, uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will leave those of you who are listening as opposed to watching about how I've illustrated this, uh, this point that I've just made. Um, Apple does seem to have uh, paid close attention to how they implement this. Uh, the only trip ups that, and this is something that Wall Street Journal has put uh, talked about in, in a blog, as uh, I think they talked to someone at Apple who mentioned that uh, if you've got sweaty fingers, that's going to be a problem. If you've got like lotion on your fingers, that's also going to be a problem. That seems like 
obvious that if there's something that is given that you are just putting your finger on something that's essentially a scanner, an optical scanner, something that's going to smear your uh, your fingerprint is not going to it's not going to help out. Also, warning that if you have scars on your fingertips, if you have if you are a background character in a 1930s gangster movie who has dipped your fingertips in acid to remove your fingerprints, also possibly a problem if you've removed uh, all of your fingerprints. Uh, but if I like the fact that. It's not. It's not as though Apple has done away with the passcode and replaced it with a, with a fingerprint. There are still instances in which it will still ask for your passcode if you have not, for instance, used your fingerprint authentication in X number of time. It will default to okay. We're going to have to ask you to do two step authentication before we will let you uh, authenticate with your uh, uh, with your with your thumbprint again. One thing that kind of kind of occurred to me though, as I was fooling around with it and going through uh, the the menus uh, last week, that you can authenticate like up to five fingers, and that's a really important. Because because you know, sometimes you take your phone out with your left hand, sometimes with your right hand. You know, sometimes you might it might be on your desk. You might want to authenticate with a thing with your index finger. But let's say that again, if if you've got more than two kids, then cumulatively your children are far more clever than you are and far more devious. And if let's say that your passcode has been compromised for like a, a three day period, can your kid now read you use your one two three four password to authenticate his finger? And now he can actually get into your phone uh, and make uh, make more purchases for uh, for Simpsons Tapped Out or something like that. So <laughs> well, actually, I I would step in and say that actually you want your kids to be able to get into your phone. For instance, my son is my text message reader in in the car. He's completely in charge of the iPhone in the car. He's like my Siri assistant, and I absolutely will be giving him a fingerprint on my phone. Same with my husband. This is great. They can get in my phone, and nobody has to memorize any more passwords. I mean. They'll probably still need to know what the password is for a backup, but thankfully they probably won't memorize it. So at least they'll be able to get in some of the time very easily. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that, that, go ahead. I'm sorry, Renee, go ahead. I was going to say, one of the, the things I like is how deeply Apple see, and it looks like Apple's been working on this for years. It's not just they bought a company last year and implemented it, but they've been working on this literally for several years now. And they, for example, they scan the subdermal layer. It's not just the skin on top, it's the living skin underneath. So, you know, morbidity aside, dead fingers, you know, won't <laughs> unlock your phone. They also keep it on the hardware. We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to test that out, Renee, frankly. I, the guy on the truck. You're, 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 you're Canadian innocent. You don't know how life is here in these United States. We'll we'll figure that one out. Someone so, will get past that. And the people who are looking at it so far say like it literally stays on the hardware. It doesn't even get put into RAM. So it goes yeah. from the sensor to the chip so that you don't have to worry about some clever developer or agency figuring out a way to pull it you know, from anywhere that Apple doesn't intend it to go. And I know there's a lot of people who say, you know, I'm going to put a sticker over this the same way I put a sticker over my web camera or my microphone. But if you're willing, if you're willing to have your identity proven by this device, it looks like Apple is going the extra mile to make sure it's as secure, as easy, and as robust a process as possible. And that's just exactly what Mike said. That's the hallmark of the kinds of technologies that they slowly roll out. Yeah. I mean, my, my understanding is that uh, no software on the phone even has access to the authentication process. All it can do is ask the hardware, could you please use the, could you please authenticate this user? And then this, there is a secure portion of the A7 processor that handles that. Uh, and then it simply gets back a yes or a no. Yep. And well, what, what was the checksum? Not telling you. Well, is, <laughs> is you, are you pretty sure or just really sure? I'm telling you, I, I vouch for this person. I, you asked me if I'm going to vouch for it. I'm telling you, I vouch for him. That's all I'm going to do for you. So yeah, because if 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 there were like a, a, a if there were like a hash that represented a unique signature represented by your fingerprint and that got out, that you could I can change my passcode. Changing my fingerprints, whole other issue. And I'm not I'm not sure if it's as easy as going through the dictionary and finding a word another yet another synonym for dragon that I don't think anybody else has thought of yet. <laughs> um, but getting back to the A7, that's uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not we're this is just the 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 5S is just the first device we're going to see that has the A7. Uh, it's a natural to think that we're going to see that in whatever refreshed uh, iPad comes out, uh, hopefully later on this year. But I'm surprised at how much traction people are giving to the idea of the A7 processor as the heart of uh, a MacBook Air next year. Uh, uh, what what do you think about that, Mike? Is it, do you, I mean, I I think that I thought that the it, it, I'm not sure that I understand enough about the A7 to be able to answer the question: What problem will the A7 solve that Intel's Haswell strategy is not going to solve? I mean, this year's processors are already doing 
kick ass for, uh, uh, for, for, for power constraints. Next year's wave of, of updates is going to even be even better. So I'm not sure I understand what problem the A7 would solve. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know either. And um, I've, I've, I've long suspected that um, Apple's long strategy is to move iOS up into the, the general desktop space, the general laptop space, um, and, and sort of eventually have a, a system where the content consumers are all using iOS and the content content creators are all using uh, uh, OS 10 or something like that. And so it could be that they want to just take all the mobile stuff as it becomes, as Moore's law makes it all more powerful and move it all up like the Jeffersons. I don't know uh, one way or the other, but one, one of the questions that I, that I wanted to ask the panel, because I, I personally don't know, a lot of the a uh, promise of of a uh, 64 bit uh, processing requires a heck of a lot of ram and do we even know how much ram is going to be in the new iphone it's mm. i mean if the, the numbers on the chipset are being read as 1 gigabyte as an outside chance there's more um, although I mean, 64-bit it does it has a lot to do with the amount of registers you can read at once, so, which is sort of like the old thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can keep stuff in RAM. You don't have to go to the hard disk. This way, you can keep more on the chip. You don't even have to go to RAM. So it <laughs> it, it speeds it up that way. And the instruction set is so much faster anyway that you get a lot of the boosts that Apple was suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a surprisingly controversial question because with a lot of a lot of things I've read uh, saying that 64-bit doesn't won't change anything and other other articles saying it will change everything and 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 the more persuasive ones to me are the ones that say that uh that route of 64-bit processing will change everything radically but not yet and so um so i'm really curious i mean it's it's just a kind of an exciting that's one of the most exciting things about this whole thing is what is really what's it really going to be like to 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 uh really work hard on this thing and see what kind of performance it gets. Um, but, but yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a mystery, but I, I, you know, who, you also don't know the, the extent to which, you know, what, what, uh, Apple's relationship is with Intel. Um, and I'd be curious to be a fly on the wall to, to know, uh, uh, what, what's going on there, but, um, who knows? One of the interesting Maybe. things is, and this, this is a, I believe this is a record. Yeah, Apple's been working on um, putting OS 10 on ARM for years. I mean, I've heard about it as a serious project going back to 2011. Ma Mac uh, OS or OS? Oh, uh, OS 10, Mac OS on to ARM um, since at least 2011. I mean, there was a there was a published paper about porting. Uh, from an Apple intern about porting, I think it was Tiger to ARM, might have been, even been earlier. And, you know, WWDC last year and this year, there were a lot of people wondering, you know, how far along that project is and when is Apple going to get serious about it. But it sounds like a very serious project and it might be non not intuitive at first, but when you start thinking about a very light MacBook Air-like product that gets 24 hours of battery life, you know, and and does a limited amount of computing, but lets you do it for an incredibly long period of time, and that Apple can control that chipset and its destiny in a way far beyond what it can do with Intel and their roadmap, it seems like a very Apple thing to do, given both their history and where it looks like they're going. Mm. I mean, it's, it's very much... Uh, in style for what Apple would be thinking to, even if they're largely happy with their relationship with Intel to make sure that they have a plan B ready just in case things go sour or whether they have an, a better opportunity in a couple of years. I kind of, I, when all of this talk about uh, the 64 bit uh, uh, hardware, it really, the, the message that I really heard last week was not so much, hey, look, we've got this phone with a 64 bit processor, but that we are updating our entire mobile library for 64 bits. So I was I was thinking more along the lines of a year or two from now a more powerful iOS based iPad or something or a, a new idea that is kind of a a better hybrid between a an iPad and a MacBook Air because right now I, I we've well established that I love the iPad and I use it to every single day for real real work but there's still so many things that it could do better if you're going to be using it as a real real work machine so I think it's more of a vote for 64-bit software in the next few years than necessarily having the a7 become the new standard for uh, for for the Mac but first and the, foremost that, that, video editing I think is what what would benefit the most probably for most users with a much more powerful iPad but are people really going to be using the iPad for serious video editing? Uh, I think they would. I mean, serious. I mean, 
I think most people won't be doing serious what 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 we what we communicators right. uh, would yeah. call yeah. serious. But I, mean, I currently edit my all my uh, videos on YouTube on the, in the cloud. So any improvement on that would be welcomed by me personally. Yeah. And, and also, I just, I've just corrected myself. There, it's so easy to think in traditional terms that when I think about powerful video editing, I think of, oh, so why would someone want to run Final Cut on an iPad? But we've just yeah. seen uh, last week demonstrations of, uh, we were just, not to get back on, uh, 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 we were talking about the camera earlier, and that's probably the one user-facing feature that I'm most excited about, that if you want to see the power of the A7 chip, it's the idea that, you know what, we are just going to always be looking at and deciding what kind of, uh, looking at the scene whenever you have the camera app open, so that by the time you touch that shutter, we've already essentially taken that photo 80 million different times and figured out exactly the way to do it, and we are going to take multiple pictures and create a single synthetic image yeah. that has tone mapping because we have that much power there. So now you've got me, after correcting myself, thinking about well, what could you do with a video editor if you have enough oomph that you could that the app could actually look at your entire 38 minutes worth of uh, of 1080 HD video and know that well, here are shots of medium shots of people with faces looking at the camera. Here are wide shots with motion. Here are wide shots that are static. After after producing a shot list like that, can we simply do a really good rough edit for the user just by the virtue of the fact that we have this kick-ass processor uh, on this little mobile device? So it's, it's, I am humbled and, and chastising myself to remember that uh, the powerful editing, powerful photo, powerful software is a very different thing when you, when you put it through Apple's filter of what power actually means. I, I think where we're headed, I mean, it, it, where where this is really going is that, that we're we're headed for the elimination of a difference between video and still photography, where everything will be video and every frame of video will be a really beautiful still photograph, and so instead of just capturing that specific moment, you know you you'll just hold your phone up in in the photo mode, and then you'll just there'll be a wheel or some kind of interface that allows you to quickly go through and say that's the one I want. Push a button and up it goes yeah. to Facebook or whatever. And, and and I think that you know we're really getting not just with phones of course, but with all digital cameras to the point where you know in in 10, 10 or fifteen years we may you know people may not look at still photos and video as being so different. They may be pretty much the same thing. Mm. I mean, I'm I, I I'm sorry I interrupted you earlier about say, when you said that the iPhone 5 is the best camera out there. It's it's obviously a subjective opinion. I I think that after using the Lumia 1020 and the Nokia uh, for a couple of months, I and using it side by side with the iPhone 5, I don't think the iPhone 5 is in its class. Uh, and I'm also, but I only mm -hmm. bring that up because that's that's I think the, I think that you're going to see a real duel with in philosophies, a battle of philosophies between a phone like the Lumia 1020 and the iPhone uh, 5S, where the Lumia has incredible hardware features that cause it to make take great pictures. I don't think that the uh, the 5S has that wonderful color balance dual LED flash, but it's still an LED. It can't do what a strobe flash can do, which is what the Lumia 1020 yeah. has. The Lumia 1020, it's a lot of a lot has been said about its 40 megapixel image sensor. But what the real effect of the image sensor isn't taking 40 megapixel sensors, but taking a beautiful five megapixel image that's a slice of wherever you want to move it. So it really does have a zoom, uh, zoom feature that I've been using a lot. And the third thing is the level of control that you have over every single camera setting. There's the difference yeah. between, for me, the iPhone 5, nothing, and the Lumia is that I, I can't think of any situation in which I was not able to take a picture with the Lumia which is not something that I associate with any other phone, including the iPhone 5. You know, we, we, we've all been there where we are someplace where we're going to take a picture of, of a kid or one of our family members or just a cool scene. And we take the picture, doesn't work. We try tap to focus, tap to expose, doesn't work. And we simply put the phone back in our pocket because we say, okay, this is simply one of those pictures that a camera phone cannot take. And so the Lumia doesn't have that restriction. However, mm -hmm. The, my, my frustration with the Lumia is the same as with most other phones in that it just does not understand color balance as well as Apple seems to know what it is. It doesn't understand the it, it, it doesn't understand hum, the, how humans emotionally react to a picture the way that uh, Apple puts that into everything every single thing they do. So I really think that that's going to be again, a battle of philosophies. Do you get a great picture by yeah. putting in great hardware? Do you get a great picture by trying to be smart enough to look at the data that's being collected and use it to build something that you think the humans are going to enjoy? So I, I don't know if there's yeah. going to be a winner. I think it's going to be a, a, a choice of, uh, of, of what you like, what, what, what pleases you. 
Well, speaking of humans enjoying it, I mean, the biggest elephant in the Lumia living room is the fact that it doesn't run iOS or Android. So yeah. it's almost like, you know, I think for the, for the average consumer who needs to be part of one of the two big app ecosystems, et cetera, it's, it's almost like a standalone digital camera. It's out there. It's outside of the, yeah, the world like of what's happening in terms of apps. Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. So, so it's... Mm -hmm. In, in, in my review, I compared it to uh, between the compar the comparison between iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. It's like the difference between living in New York, living in Brooklyn, and <laughs> living in Boston, where the, they're three very nice cities. If you have an iPhone, you live in New York, meaning if you want to get a Kanish at three thirty in the morning, you can get a Kanish. You get all the first one first run Broadway shows. You get to see Louis C.K. testing out material before his national tour. If you live in Brooklyn, you have access to that, but it's a little bit more of a hassle to get there. You maybe you have to wait an hour or half an hour to, to 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 get to there. Boston is lovely. I live I live in the Boston area all my life. It's a wonderful city. You should consider moving and raising we we hear raising your kids here, but you're going to get the road show of Book of Mormon. You're going to have to like, you know, get a Kanish when the store is open and you'll be lucky if Louis CK even plays here as opposed to anything like that. But the but the the interesting thing and this this might be something that uh, that'd be great for everyone to really chime in on. We all care about this stuff. There is a level – sometimes I wonder if we care about this way, way more than ordinary users do. I mean, yes, Windows Phone has a minuscule app library compared to iOS or Android, but it's got the hits. You can get Comixology on it. You can get Netflix on it. You, it works well with Evernote and all that, or all that sort of uh, – all this other sort of stuff. Google's has absolutely no interest in developing anything that's native for it, and there's – you're never going to see the a good game or you're never going to see a good service for it in the first year, if ever. But – Maybe peep, maybe a phone that does the core functions extremely well, but also has this kick butt camera, which means that you're going to have a beautiful picture of your of your kids and your dogs, as opposed to one that's kind of okay. I don't know. I mean, how, how do you make that argument? And whoever wants to chime in on that. Well, the the way I make it, is, yeah, the way I make it is that the, the people who are care about super high quality pictures, people care about the difference between an iPhone five or iPhone five S quality picture and a Lumia picture are the same people who care about all the apps and, and, and geeks. And, and by the way, the other thing that one of the best things about the, the iOS platform is the hardware add-ons, the sort of hardware version of apps. Like, you you know, I, I write a lot about, um, uh, you know, lo low cost smartphone-based home automation and almost everything is iPhone-based. All the little, you know, things that replace the peephole that use an old iPhone for a camera and the thing that communicates with your dog and drops a, drops a doggy bone, you know, over the internet and all this kind of stuff. Those are all iOS compatible things. If you have a Lumia, you're completely outside of the entire world of, of, of smartphone uh, aftermarket fun, fun, fun stuff. But, but back to the point, it's the same people. You know, I mean, most people are uploading to Facebook. Facebook will destroy your pick your photographs with through lousy compression and aggressive compression. It doesn't matter what phone you took it uh, with, unless you're uploading it to Google Plus and have like you've gone through the whole uh, you, you've opted into the thing that where it doesn't modify your pictures or you're using Flickr. You know, in other words, it, unless you're in some small tiny subgroup of people who really really care about photographs, it doesn't matter how what quality yeah. your picture is because Facebook's going to yeah. wreck it. But that, that also makes the case that that the uh, even the Samsung Galaxy S3 that you're getting for free, even the iPhone 4, which you can get for free on that level, is as good as the iPhone 5S camera. I mean, in, in terms yeah. of what people are going to care about. Ta Tony, what do you uh, think? I, I think people, for the most part, normal people really, it's not that they don't care. It's just that they're focused on the other things. So it, it comes up so low on their care list that they end up effectively not caring. I think most people get smartphones just on a whim and more ideally because their friends have a similar phone or their other family members have a similar phone because then they get the synergy of learning from each other or more readily uh, sharing stuff. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's that's why. But I think before the show, I was uh, I was talking to Mike because he's using the uh, or uh, who's using the uh, the Moto X, which is a phone that I absolutely love. And man, if it had a better camera, that might very possibly yep. be my next phone. Or excuse me, it would be without knowing anything about the iPhone 5s. That would have been, it's uh, the iPhone 5s is uh, it's uh, I gotta admit it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empty phone. I like the phone. It's kind of a tempting phone. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm one of these people who cares enough about photography that the fact that yeah. okay the Moto will take 
okay photos that I can fix when I get them into Aperture. Ugh, I wish it took yeah, better but pictures, but you, though. But you can take mediocre pictures fast with the Moto yeah. X. Right, and it, and it works and it works very very easily. I mean the 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 fit, it's 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 cool to see the effect that Apple has had the positive effect it's had on so many other phone makers that I, I really do think that the I, folks at Motorola who made the camera app that's now on all of their like their their Droid phones as well as the Moto X their idea was no it really should be more like the more like what the uh, what the iPhone does where there is one button. You tap this yep. one button, you get a picture. And now because we are, I am the phone and I have all these smarts, it's my job after you tap that one button to figure out how to make a good picture out of this. Again, it's too mm -hmm. bad that the hardware kind of lets it down, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting way of, of, of separating that between like the Samsung's camera app, which is we have one button, one slider switch, one drop down menu, one, <laughs> uh, one AB switch, <laughs> one slide in tab. I mean, the, the idea of I, one of the things I love about the, the Lumia is that it's the, the, the human brain is still really, really good at looking at a picture and, just, and deciding what's wrong. It's like I look at the picture that just got shot. Yeah. I can say, I really want that to be not quite so bright. On the Lumia, tap a button and you have a little slider that lets you simply take that down and stop. Yeah. You can and you keep moving it until it's perfect and then you let go. On a Samsung, it's OK, what menu is that behind? And now what men sub menu is that behind? And how long is that going to stick? It's like I can't get out see the, the manual. You start flipping pages. Ugh, yes, I mean, people people who think that I talk too much about Android and that I'm an Android fanboy, you should see me inside a museum after the battery for my real camera has died and I've got to rely on this damn thing <laughs> for all my pictures. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that, 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 that really is the most, uh, 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 such a user-facing feature because... Yeah. There's the, we're every everyone has LTE. Everyone except for Apple has larger screens. Everyone has all these really interesting features. It's the, the taking a picture and seeing how good that picture is is one of the few things that are left where uh, uh, any company can really stand head and shoulders over any other company by giving you a knockout photo. Uh, and I mean, if you if you look through your your camera roll, you see you'll you'll you're, if you kept enough photos on your camera roll, you will come across that picture where. Thank God you had a halfway decent phone in your pocket or uh, camera in your pocket because here is a moment that would have like you you didn't know that you know when you left the house this is going to be the last time you got to play with your dog before he got sick and you know was not there for you when he came back again I, I, I hate to bring people I hate to bring it down but that's that's the price of the, the the camera that's always in your pocket you just take lots and lots of pictures with it and you don't know how significant a photo is until. You realize how three months later that oh boy if, if if I'm so glad I had this chance to take this one picture or I'm, even something something like gee I was so happy at this part I was just commuting home and I saw this beautiful thing and this reminds me of how happy I was at that moment that's the sort of thing where I mean there are people who just kind of dump things to Instagram and then do horrible horrible I mean, the, 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 so, some of the things that Instagram does to photos they should be brought up in front of the tribunal at the Hague for the things <laughs> that Instagram does to these beautiful pictures that the iPhone is taking uh, but I mean it's great well, that you you know, but, but you're actually you're actually bringing up a, a, another weakness of the iPhone which is that uh, compared to other systems um, uh, I know Andy that you in addition to using the Moto X also use Google Glass uh, and you know one of the things that makes a good photo good is the ability to take a picture very quickly you see something it's a moment that happens for one second and if you don't ever take the picture then it's not a good picture and if you can capture it wow what an amazing picture because you captured this fleeting moment and you can do that with google glass you can do that with the moto x and uh, you know it would be great for apple to do more moto x type things to because they certainly have they seem to have a lot more processing power they you know, when, so for, for those unfamiliar with Moto X, you, you sort of twist your wrist twice to turn on the camera and it's ready to take pictures. There's like a second lag or so. And then you just touch anywhere on the screen. It auto focuses. It doesn't focus where you touch unless you choose that setting. Uh, but it, the default mode is you touch the screen and it will take pictures as fast as it can. Yeah. As fast as it can is pretty much a picture every three quarters of a second or so. It's not that fast, maybe half second. It's not that fast. Um, what would be killer for Apple with all this amazing hardware and stuff to, to have a quick go straight to the camera gesture and then just yeah. be able to do rapid fire. I mean, I have a Canon EOS 7D, which can take eight pictures a second and do that for 130 seconds. Many of my best ones where people, I fool people into thinking I'm a good photographer is the fact that I was, I took a hundred pictures and one of them by some miracle Absolutely. happened to be a good photo. 
you know, if, if you know, that's a that's just a basic fundamental thing. The speed of how quickly can I be taking pictures, and how many pictures can I take in a yep. in a in three seconds? Like that that would be great for Apple to really get on you know on board with that, or at least you know, you know, at least uh, yeah, there there are apps that do that. So maybe that's good enough for the for the enthusiast. But it, th that's one area that I like to see them improve. They don't have the gesture stuff yet. They do have the fast camera access button on the lock screen, which is it's better than yep. it used to be, but you just pull it up and you can start taking photos. I, iPhone 5S has burst mode. So you hold your finger down on the button. It'll take 10 photos a second as long as you're holding your finger down. But, you know, in some imaginary world where this wasn't ND8 and someone had been doing, uh, for example, rapid fire tests on an iPad 2, which is the, one of the oldest hardware to get iOS 7, the, the speed of the shutter, and they've shown this off on stage on iOS 7, is amazing. Even if you just tap your finger over and over again on mm -hmm. older iPhones. You're going to have a really pleasant surprise come Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there are a lot of cameras like that. But I, I, I think that the, 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 the pendulum of history is really going towards uh, the approach of Apple and the Moto X. The, 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 other, the other thing that the Moto X does is it will intelligently figure out that, okay, there is no way in hell I'm getting a good picture out of here unless I turn on HDR. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not even going to ask. I'm just going to make this an HDR picture. But yeah. I, I think that, that and you, you brought up, uh, uh, you brought up the uh, Google Glass. People are often really amazed when I post something and they find out that this is something I, a photo I took with Google, uh, with Google Glass, because again, it doesn't look, it's a, chintzy little thing on the side of the side of your face. It yeah. doesn't look like it's a real camera. And that's the exact same thing it's doing. It's using the intelligence of, uh, it, it uses a, a very, very common uh, imaging element, but then uses a lot of software to figure out, okay, how do I take this data and turn it into a great picture? So uh, they added in one of the first updates they did to Google Glass that got pushed out. Uh, it's uh, It will do auto HDR. When you put it onto Google Plus, they bought uh, Nick software, uh, a while ago th th that makes those incredible aperture and uh, and photoshop plugins so it will automatically essentially apply $800 worth of photoshop plugins to figure out how to make this picture even better so i mean i, I again i love the lumia but i think that really the, the the star of any great camera on a mobile device is going to be a great processor as opposed to necessarily yeah. great lens great image sensor uh, not not to denigrate. They they also it should be mentioned they uh, improved the, the 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 glass considerably. Now it's an f two point two instead of an f two point four. Um, yeah. In my side by side by side by side by side by side tests, one of the iPhone 5's biggest problems was that it was constantly looking for a slower shutter speed because it did not have that wide aperture. So camera shake was going to be a problem because it can't freeze the motion. Uh, anytime someone is moving, they're a blur as opposed to crisp, uh, uh, crisp sharp images. So, so, so suffice to say that I will be, <laughs> I will be driving myself nuts starting from Friday onward to try to figure out uh, which one of these cameras is my favorite one. Um, <laughs> last thing, and this is, I, I say, let, let's let's save the the least interesting bit of. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we haven't even talked about the 5C. Poor, poor iPhone 5C, not having a really that cool camera and the fingerprint sensor. All you have are, are fashion colors, and now people are thinking that you're you're like the the middle sister on the Brady Bunch now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, I'll, I'll say that I'll, I'll I certainly thought it was it was better than I thought it was going to be because I was sort of anticipating last year's hardware using new manufacturing techniques to make it a viable $99 phone, but they really did update. It really is a 2013 phone. It's not a 2012 phone, uh, which pleased me a lot. Uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, Renee, was that your take about it from a two? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think we saw some of the period, worst period Apple analysis ever over the last week, uh, just based on people who had assumptions on other markets and weren't really attuned to how Apple has historically done business. But this was an incredibly Apple camera, they uh, Apple phone. They took something that was hard to manufacture that they would have previously dropped $100 and tried to sell. Or, you know, it was sold, but it would have been a pain in the butt for them to do it. And they made it much easier to manufacture. It's got much more mainstream appeal because colors are, you know, really appealing to a lot of people. They improved the FaceTime camera, although, you know, Craig Federici did not say selfies. He did say self-portraits. Uh, and it's got a the better <laughs> LTE band, so it's more available in more countries, including TDD LTE, which is what you need to go to China. Uh, it was never going to be a cheap phone. It was always going to be less expensive. And it's very much in the pattern of the iPod mini, the iPad mini, even the Mac mini, where it just adds you know a little bit more addressable market to Apple. And if you can you know, increase your addressable market even by a little bit, it's a phenomenal increase in revenue. And I think this shows that Apple, you know, they'll do the big phone next year. This year they're doing the slight increase in the affordability phone. Yeah, I mean, I, I did a, 
a, a big analysis on, on what colors mean in, in China and elsewhere in Asia. And it's, I, I really think that the colors, they're going to be nice in the U.S. The, the kids are going to love them. It, it solves the problem of how do you, you know, a lot of Asian phone companies like to sell a, a target phones at girls and women. And they do it by saying, oh, it looks just like a makeup case and it's pink and all this stuff. And then they get eviscerated in the Western press by saying it's sexist, it's horrible, you think they're a bunch of ditzes and so on. It's a big controversial, controversial thing. These guys, and also Moto X, by the way, have come out with a way to have a pink phone, which is yeah. going to be very popular all over the world, uh, without saying, well, here's a girly phone for the girls uh, that's pink and trivial. Um, but, but, so also, that's but, also having, but also having cases with contrasting colors. So, I mean, I, I think well, that this is, I think that this is sort of Apple waving the white flag and saying that, okay, we've, we've, we've been telling you, we put, we put so much effort into the design. You've said that you want to put it in a case anyway. Can we at least convince you not to put it inside a crappy looking case? But I don't think people realize the degree to which colors have a lot of symbolism in China. In yeah. fact, the, you know, um, Apple's offered black and white. Uh, and both of those colors have extremely negative con connotations in China relating to death and misfortune. And, and there's a lot of the cultural things that like we don't really talk a, a lot about that, that exist in, in other countries. In our own countries, they're invisible to us. The association of pink with girls, blue with boys, all that kind of stuff. Like we, we think those are normal, but then other people's associations aren't. So, for example, gold is a, nor is a, is a huge uh, symbolic a color yellow also is is a big one everybody likes blue globally there's a there's a whole study that's been done about the the associations the cultural associations of color so just to, just to wrap this part up i i just uh, it, not only are color associations in in the abstract much more important in china and some of these other markets that that you know china is one third of the smart global phone market by the way it's huge it's the yeah. most uh, important market by far um not only are color associations more important but then the specific colors that they came out with have been very tightly targeted uh to appeal to 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 the to the chinese market and to a lesser extent to the indian market i think there's going to be a huge rush of um of market share once these things get out there and people see them in, in the flesh they're all going to want them and the colors are a, a, a truly important thing actually mm. I thought I thought their colors were kind of weird. I mean, they were very creamy sort of colors. Um, hey, Tani, what, what was your reaction to the five C? Well, I, I I think that the colors are, are actually important for for lots of different markets. You know, already good comments about China, but I think that some people just feel like they're not iPhone kind of people. That the iPhone is <laughs> is kind of too sophisticated, too James Bondy, you know, too elitist you know, too fancy. And that's something that just has a more of a, I don't know, a low brow look. No, the, the plastic colors are not super, um, they're not like beautiful colors. I don't think most people would feel that they're beautiful, not not most no, most folks in uh, North America anyway, but they have a, a different kind of, of, of appeal. And so I think that's that is going to be very important. Now for Apple, not only strategically are they just getting out there with a whole lot more colors, they're also getting out there with a product that they can make a lot more easily. So they're going to have a higher profit margin. And that's going to be very important for them too. So I think I think it's exciting. And, and what I would love is if Apple would publish the statistics on how uh, many of the different colors are purchased and maybe break it out by country or some other demographics. I think that would be really fun to look at. Yeah, there, there was there were some reports somewhere about how the, the yellow was already back ordered. Uh, I checked this morning, and really, any color you want, it will ship on the on the ship date. Uh, uh, that's uh, there's a I, we're, 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 uh, we need to sort of move along. So let's let's just uh, let's just all like just just like on Sunday services, you have to say the Lord's prayer. We will say that. Stock analysts are are on the stock responded to the announcements by having a dip in the stock price, and this means nothing because who cares what the stock price means when you're making <laughs> as much money as off as Apple does? Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break uh, <laughs> for a message from via our good friend Leo Laporte uh, from our friends at Audible. Hi, Andy and everybody. Thank you for letting me interrupt. I want to talk a little bit about Audible.com. You know we love Audible.com. Andy's a big Audible fan. I'm a big Audible fan. That's because 
when I was commuting from Tech TV two hours a day in the car, road rage was always just around the corner. Audible saved me from strangling some other driver because I was listening to great audiobooks. I have literally, since 2000, since I joined Audible, listened to over 500 books, books I would have probably never read. And that's what's great about it. It brought literature back into my life. It brought, it brought nonfiction, great stories, biographies, thrillers. I read practically all the Stephen King novels. I read all the Aubrey Maturin novels. I love Audible.com. I know you will, too. They are the guys for audiobooks, 150,000 titles, all kinds of literature, fiction, nonfiction, even periodicals. In fact, if you visit Audible.com slash MacBreak right now, you'll sign up for that gold account that's a book a month. You also get the audio version of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal each day as part of the subscription. So, I mean, that's a, this is a really great deal. One month free. Visit audible.com slash Mac break. Pick a book. Listen to it. I'm going to let Andy recommend a book because uh, I know he, he's always listening to something great. In fact, I listen to Andy's recommend. This is one of the things Audible uh, subscribers do when they get together. What are you listening to? What do you like? Audible.com slash Mac break. Your first book's free. And you can cancel in the first 30 days. Pay nothing. But that book will be yours to keep forever. Audible.com slash Mac break. Andy, what are you listening to these days? We'll let Andy tell us. <laughs> a really exciting book that just got released uh, last week. Uh, it's called Hollywood Said No, Orphan Film Scripts, Bastard Scenes, and Abandoned Darlings from the Creators of Mr. Show. Uh, it's written by David Cross and Bob Odenkirk. Uh, I should not have to explain to you what Mr. Show is. Incredible sketch comedy show that aired on HBO. Uh, the bad news for the show was that HBO didn't particularly care much about it, which is why you even can't get it on uh, HBO Go app. The good news is that they didn't care much about it, which meant that they let these guys just and these these women do whatever they wanted. And they did. The influence of the show is just can't be uh, can't be uh, overstated. Uh, it's 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 so good, and so this is a collection of all bunches of scripts that they've had for screenplays for sketches that cannot be produced now. That's kind of dead projects, and they thought that well, we may as well share this with people uh, rather than just leave them on our shelves. So it is a book, but all but for the audio book, they actually got, even got in uh, Brian Prosen, and so they're sort of it's sort of like radio shows now. They're performing their scripts in a certain way. Uh, so. It's only three hours and 49 minutes. You know my philosophy. If you're getting a free book, you may as well stick it to the man and get, get the unabridged Bible. Uh, but uh, you'll, you'll have probably more laughs in this than even in the New Testament. So uh, that's my pick for this one. Um, before we go to picks of the week, just a few quick ones. Uh, we're going to move on to the potpourri category. Uh, I really had to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> uh I was at I was at the uh, I was at the uh, the launch event of course last week, and uh, and in gadget reporter uh, uh, Miriam Waray I'm, I'm, I've been reading her stuff I don't know can't I hope I'm pronouncing her last name correctly Miriam Waray uh, was using a, a Lumia 1020 phone third appearance of the Lumia phone in this podcast to take pictures to for for the site and of course unfortunately Tim Tim uh, Tim Cook was there and said yeah you need to get a different phone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that's, I think, uh, I think that's certain, that's definitely an indication of the difference in attitude or the public perception between Tim Cook and Steve Jobs. It's like, uh, I, I, I like that. I, I think that Tim Cook is definitely the sort of person who would make a joke like that. And if Steve Jobs, he might've made a joke like that, but it might feel partially sinister. Uh, yes. I had a, I had a chance to, uh, through a story that's way too long to, to share here. I, uh, this is this happened to be my first opportunity to meet, shake hands with, and have a brief discussion with Tim Cook, and it was it was totally circumstantial. It was the sort of thing where okay, well, it would be awkward here if I did not have a conversation with him and simply said, "I don't know who you are, and I don't care who you are." Uh, and he was friendly, he was nice, he was avuncular, and it made me think, okay, my career is not ended because I've had a conversation with Tim Cook. Uh, <laughs> I, is, is anybody else had interactions with Tim, with uh, with Tim Cook like that? I mean, at, least, at, least, at least this fits in with what it's it's like when you when you find out that someone that, that Tom Hanks really is a really nice guy and you're the impression that you've gotten over the past couple of years is actually true. Uh, so again, neither Miriam nor I know Tim Cook very, very well, of course, but given an opportunity to really, really make us feel terrible. He did not. So that was a cool thing. I have um, she should have asked Miriam to sign her fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> I don't see even see even I like I, I, I'm a fan of Google Glass. I didn't even bring it to the to, to, to the West Coast with me because I knew that if I were seen anywhere with Google Glass on the on the inside this venue, 
maybe not the politic maybe not politically the best thing that I could do. I mean, you don't you don't worry about politics, but still it's like you don't you don't pull the tiger's tail unless there is a result that requires you to get the tiger's tail pulled. You, you would end up with you would end up with me and Leo across the street in the Starbucks henceforward <laughs> um, on the on the blacklist. Yes, the 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 the, the mobile news van uh, that has to be at least fifty yards away at all times. <laughs> um, other thing that uh, another really interesting thing from Wired, uh, when their lawyers uh, had a really cool article about the fingerprint scanner, uh, not necessarily about the five S fingerprint scanner, I should point out, but fingerprint scanners in general, mentioning that it might influence how uh, people uh, their, their people's ability to plead the Fifth Amendment if they are in any sort of a legal situation uh, because and this is them uh, I'm going from the article here obviously not a lawyer here uh, saying that if you have uh, your if you have your data encrypted via a password the law the, the Fifth Amendment says that if there's information that's inside your head the state does not have the ability to rip it out of your head so just like they can't force you to incriminate yourself you can plead the Fifth Amendment and use and use that tactic with your lawyers to try to avoid having to testify or, or having to uh, say, give the answers that the that the that the nation wants to the government wants to give them you can say I plead the Fifth Amendment uh, and so if you are, if you have information that's secured with a password that is inside your head, that you can at least try to uh, invoke the Fifth Amendment to say, no, I'm not going to give you the password to decrypt my data. However, according to this article, this is uh, a, a fingerprint uh, authentication. That's not information inside your head. That's just your fingerprint. You do not have knowledge of what these loops and whirls are. And so this is more like if you have the keys to a safety deposit box, uh, you could be forced, you, you could try, you uh, he's, she's suggesting that you would not be able to uh, try to use Fifth Amendment protection to avoid having to unlock uh, your data, which is pretty interesting. It just it just goes to show that every time there's new technology, all the great ideas, there's always something on the side of it that we haven't really figured out yet or don't understand until it gets out into the world. Does, does, does this creep anybody out? I mean, even if you look at it um, more maliciously than a police officer, it is it is probably harder to brute force a password out of somebody than it is to physically restrain them and stick their finger on it. So it's one <laughs> of those things where convenience is always at war with security and everyone has to make up an individual decision about how far they want to take security and how much they want to mitigate it with, you know, convenience. Yeah. Also, are there, are there cases where you have data written down on paper that's in a safe and you get dragged before the grand jury or whatever, and they say, tell us the, you know, the information that's inside the safe. And for, has anybody ever said, well, you no, know, it's, 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 it's protected by a, a lock combination that's in my head. And did, did the judge or whatever just say, well, I guess we can't uh, ever know that information. Well, let's move on. I, I mean, think that's has that ever even existed? Um, um, Renee? You know, I think they cover that in the Wired article that combinations that are stored in your mm -hmm. brain again better legal protection than keys. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. It sounds like if you want to hide your stuff, you're just going to have to think about what you secure it behind. Yeah, yeah. it's. It, I, I yeah, imagine like don't some... put it on your phone. Yeah, like if yeah. you want to, you know, have super illegal stuff or super secret stuff, you better put it somewhere else. And if you put it behind a password that only that you've only memorized, well, then you've got the question of if you're going to forget your password. So that's a problem too. Something to yeah. think about. Yeah, I mean, you, before we, the, we, when the police are knocking on the door, put your phone in the safe and lock the safe in the toilet nope. and flush or flush it down the toilet. <laughs> Because, because at minimum, if they take it back to the Apple store, the genius is going to see that red dot inside of there, not going to let the cop have a free phone. So <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I'm in jail, but hell with you. Um, another, uh, another nice announcement from last week that Apple is going to sort of extend its iLife strategy from the desktop to mobile. And now every, uh, every new, newly purchased iPhone and iPad will come with, excuse me, will come with a license for the iLife and iWork suites, just like uh, you can, when you uh, configure it, it will give you an opportunity to download iBooks and other free Apple software. We'll also let you download all these uh, commercial apps. Um, I think that's a, I think it's a good thing because it helps people think of this as the powerful device that it is. On the other hand, I was so looking forward to the new suite, the, the, the new collection of, of productivity apps we were going to see now that Apple has given developers access to really good text styling tools and, and stuff like that. They're essentially saying, well, good luck competing with this free app that is 
being supported by 10,000 people in one of the most powerful tech companies of the world. But if you want to write your own word processor or your own business app, go ahead. <laughs> they don't even have enough I mean, engineers to reskin them, Andy. I mean, it's going to be easy to compete yes. with Apple for the next year. There's a, there's a lot of leather to pull up there. You're right. Absolutely right. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you, Andy. It seems like a real mixed bag for, uh, you know, great for new users who maybe are on the fence about getting an Apple mobile device. They can, you know, sort of perceive that they're getting more value right away. But it seems, you know, perhaps typical, but still unfortunate of Apple to make it all the harder for a third party developer to compete in that space. Uh, it's, I think it's kind of stifling. The, the iPad has so much potential that even Apple hasn't tapped into yet. They're, they seem to be steering people now towards the iPad mini. I really do think that the iPad mini is now the default iPad in the, in the line. And we, the iPad is still the productivity, the business device, the business computer that is prepped for 2014, 2015, 2016, whereas laptops are still are always going to be more and more like tablets than uh, than laptops as they go. So I would like to see that next iteration of really, really uh, advanced software come. At, at minimum, I would like arrow keys to be enabled on a Bluetooth keyboard, and I would like to be able to boldface things by hitting Command B. Those would be nice. So we'll, yes, we'll, I, that would be I nice. Suppose I suppose that I should I should have baby steps as we go there. <laughs> uh, last thing before we go to uh, picks of the week, uh, we uh, some rumblings from all things D and nine to five Mac. We're going to see a new Apple TV maybe next month. I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, I literally don't know about that as <laughs> usual. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes you spend so much time in these in these shows being a wise guy that you have to say, okay, I'm not saying that I doubt it. I'm saying that I'm I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, All Things D had something interesting about a new feature that is going to come to uh, new software for Apple TVs, which is the ability to stream purchased your purchased content from iTunes to any arbitrary Apple TV. So if you're visiting someone's uh, someone's house, the fact that you have bought a, a copy of Argo means that you can now stream it from your phone to the Apple TV without having to have that file actually installed on your iPhone, which is really, really cool. I mean, if Apple really wants to make Apple TV uh, put it more front and center as part of the Apple experience, they're going to have to really give people a reason to have one in every single house and the ability to suddenly be able to access your entire library wherever you are without having to have everything on your on your precious little 16 gigabytes of storage. That's a pretty cool thing. Um, I guess this means that uh, we're not going to see an Apple, an Apple television set this year. Maybe, kind of. Maybe make Gene Munster cry. <laughs> That's okay. There's it's 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 like a, it's like the Cubs or Cubs fans or Red Sox fans. You know, next year, next. <laughs> you know, I, I was all the all the numbers told told one story, but you never know. But next year, it's, it's definitely going to happen next year. Let's go to our last commercial, and then after that, we will go to everybody for their picks of the week. Leo, what you got for us? Hi, guys. Sorry to interrupt. One more uh, point before we get on with Mac Break Weekly and our tips and tricks and stuff. I want to talk about gazelle.com. Now's the time. You got a new iPhone. It's here. Are you ready to get it? Well, maybe you want to get rid of the old one first. Don't just throw it in a drawer. That's cash. That's cash that could be in your pocket. Gazelle.com wants to buy your old iPhone. For a limited time, Gazelle is, is, is getting letting you uh, lock in today's price for your iPhone, but giving you until October 15th to send it in. That's a great deal. You'll have time to get the new iPhone. Take your data off the old iPhone. Make sure you really want it before you send it in. I love it. Gazelle always lets you lock in these uh, these prices for 30 days. You have till October 15th. That is a great deal. Gazelle, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. They've paid more than $100 million to over 600,000 customers in the last few years. Payments fast. Uh, they'll wipe the data for you. I, I always recommend you wipe it before you send it. But if you forget, you don't have to knock your head against the wall. They'll do it for you. They even pay the postage on anything worth more than a buck. So get a quote right now at gazelle.com for your old iPhone, your old smartphone of any kind, tablets. They even buy broken iPhones and iPads. It's risk-free. They'll send you a box. They'll pay the postage. And then you get paid fast by check, by PayPal, or, and this is my pro tip, you get an extra 5% if you use an Amazon gift card. Now's the time. Get some cash for those old gadgets. Buy the new stuff. Gazelle.com. Andy? Back to you. Well, thank you so very much, Leo. I hope you are safe and happy wherever you are. Uh, let's start with picks of, the, picks of the week. Let's start with Tanya. Well, hi, Andy. My pick of the week involves bicycling. 
So I bike uh, on a road bike for fun and exercise all summer. And on Wednesday nights, I bike with a group of women. Uh, if you happen to be in Ithaca, New York, please come join us uh, every Wednesday night. We have a ride. And normally I'm very iPhone involved in this group. And I'm always the one who's looking at the, the radar to dodge around rain. And uh, this year I noticed a whole lot more women seemed to be iPhone involved, but they weren't looking at the radar and they were talking about things like you just push the button. Like, okay, what's going on? So what's going on is this uh, social networking workout service that has an iPhone app called Strava, S-T-R-A-V-A. -A. Yes. And basically it is social networking with your workout buddies and other people with a whole lot of fun little little perks. As far as the iPhone app goes, basically pretty much you do. You, you push a button when you start, you push a button when you stop. There's a few other things you can do in it. But what gets really fun is after your ride, you can log on to the website and that's where you can um, social network in depth with your workout buddies who care about your workout a lot more than your Facebook or Twitter friends do. And you can compare your speeds over the same route with your workout buddies, even if they completed the route on a different day. In fact, last summer, I completed a very challenging 72 mile ride that I'd never done before. I plugged it in and all of a sudden um, on my uh, kind of route, route map, I ended up with all these like crowns and things because apparently I biked up some hills faster than anyone else which I think is probably because almost nobody else was stupid enough to bike <laughs> up those hills. Um, but I've, I'm ha having a lot of fun exploring it. And if you do uh, ride a bicycle or run, um, this could be a fun way to integrate your social networking, keeping track of your routes, um, setting goals, getting your friends to support you as you meet your goals, et cetera, uh, all, all in one app. So that is my recommendation for the week. So, and it's, I, I have I have friends who ride bikes, and they are very, I'm very very familiar with this app. Normally, uh, mostly in the form of I'm sorry, I know that we were going to have lunch today, but some bastard just beat my <laughs> beat my best time on this hill, and now I got to go back up there and get my crown back. Absolutely, those crowns. It's it's like um, you know, it's like someone giving you a little a little icon in Facebook or something. You just you just got to get them. There's something very motivating about that. Something about how we people are wired, I guess. <laughs> Tony, I know you have to go in about 10 minutes. So just in case, why don't I just let you go right here, right now? Uh, I hope, I, I'm guessing you have another product uh, more close to home that you can plug before you go? Oh, well, uh, I suppose I, I suppose I could come up with something out of my pocket. Uh, take Control Books. We write books about how to take control of your computer. Usually we focus on the Macintosh or some iPad or iPhone. Our latest book is Take Control of Your Digital Photos by Jeff Carlson. Jeff has been writing about technology for just about forever. And over the last decade, he's focused a lot on photography. And he really talks about how to set up your camera, set up your import process, input your metadata, and come up with a personalized system so that your photos go in, all of them go in, but you're able to find just the ones you want in the end. So that is our latest. That's the last of our kind of summer uh, releases. Um, you probably won't hear too much more from us until iOS or Mavericks. Although we do have a book in our back pocket, it is going to be a day and date, but we don't know what day or date it will be. <laughs> so that could be very exciting because it might be before Mavericks. Very good. Re Take Control books, always highly, highly recommended. I can't tell you about the number of times where I had to really level up my skills on a certain topic really quickly. And the first place I go is Take Control books to say, if I download this, I, I know that I know that they won't waste my time. I know that I, I know personally the people who wrote this and I know that I will not look like a jerk tomorrow morning when I have to pretend to in front of a lot of people that I know a, a lot more about iPhoto than I thought that I did. <laughs> We work, Thanks. we work hard. <laughs> and, and the effort shows. Thanks, Tanya. I will let you go. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you. I, uh, I actually have to head out on my bicycle. I'm biking to my car and then I'll be driving my car to pick up my son. So it's all very complicated and involves a bike, a bike ride. And I do have, do have to go or I'll be late. And uh, that's not cool when you're picking up your kid.
A very, very amazing race sequence of things to pick up your kid, but it works for you, so I will not judge. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Tonya. Thanks for having me. Renee, what you got for us this week? Uh, I have one I want to mention really quickly, and then I'll go to my main pick. I mean, starting tomorrow, we're gonna there's going to be a deluge of iOS 7 updated apps and new apps that are built specifically for iOS 7. So I imagine within the next you know 48 hours, anyone who has to either download apps or review apps uh, is going to be declaring bankruptcy. But a couple people <laughs> got in just ahead of time, and I think it's actually really bright because they get all the attention right now. And one is James Thompson, who is perpetually very clever. He does pCalc, and he updated it with an iOS OS 7 skin yesterday, or actually on the weekend. Uh, so he avoided the entire rush. And pCalc is an RPN calculator. It's fantastic. Uh, he's a longtime developer, really clever, and always you know knows how to do these things right. So if you like calculators, uh, pCalc fits right in on iOS 7. My main pick is a brand new app, and it's a category of apps that's, you know, for a while everyone was making a Twitter app, and now it looks like everyone is making a weather app. Uh, and that I think is because it's something people care about deeply. There are a lot of people who want just the weather they want the way they want it. And the latest one is called Perfect Weather. It's by the company formerly known as AppCubby, now known as Contrast, and they did... Um, Launch Center Pro, and they did Timer and a bunch of other apps that you're probably familiar with. And Perfect Weather, it's US only for now, but it's it's not exactly iOS 7 style, which is a good thing because if every app looked like iOS 7, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So this has a lot of, it, it is very flat, it is very modern looking, but it's also got a lot of great textures. It's got a lot of great experiences. It's got layers, so if you want the radar, it's there, but it's not getting in your way. If you want just to see what's happening today or tomorrow, it's there. It very cleverly folds away different locations so you can keep multiple locations available, but not in your face all the time. Uh, and it really does try to be that, Apple is Apple sort of simple app that does a lot when you get deeper into it. Uh, I've been playing around with it for about a week, um, and I've had really, really good results with it. So it's looks, perfect weather by contrast. Looks super, super cool. How much is that again? I forget the price. It's not available in Canada, so I had to use a beta build. Uh. So I'm not exactly sure what it costs. I'll just check. Quickly. So you're <laughs> so 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 you're waiting for availability of the Amazon App Store and weather. Well, it's one of the thick problems <laughs> with weather apps is you have to license the the radar data um, and the weather data. So, for example, Pocket Pocket Weather is fantastic, but it's Australia only because they only have access to Australian <laughs> data. This one only has access to U.S. data. So sometimes these are regional apps, but if you're uh, in the region that they service, I mean, they're really good. But really, if, if I wrote an iOS 7 app that simply had a JPEG of a screen that said it's really, really cold, don't even go out there, that would have, handle 54% of all Canadian weather? Or am That'd I just... be like the clock on, on, on 12 o'clock for me, Andy. If you write often enough that I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with anything else. <laughs> there you go. Mike, what's your pick of the week? Okay, well, um, the pick of the week is uh, an app called Moves, and uh, this is an interesting app that uh, it's not obscure. It's uh, a couple of uh, people have written about it. it; may have even appeared on the show, but it's it's actually gotten better bit lately. So, Moves is essentially a, an app that tracks your movement. It tracks whether you're walking, cycling, or running. And um, the great thing about it, and is that there is literally there are z literally zero excuses to not use this app. It's free and you don't have to do anything. You literally don't have to do anything in order to use this app. You simply download it, launch it, and then anytime you want to check your, uh, your activity level, you go to it and it'll show you each and every day uh, how, how many steps you walked, how many miles you walked, how, uh, how much time you spent walking, and also cycling and running. It automatically detects what your activity is so you don't have to say, oh, okay, I'm walking now. Um, you literally just forget about it. And then it gives you this really nice um, sort of timeline that they call a storyline that shows you your whole day. You woke up at this time, you walked this far, then you went to a coffee place, then you were sitting so duff at work all day, and then you after that you went, and it gives you your whole day. And it's just day after day. Uh, it, it'll tell you when you broke your record. Oh, that you've, this is the, the your new record for, for how far you've walked uh, since you got this app. What's cool about this, with another cool thing besides the fact that it's great for lazy people like me, and you don't have 
to do anything is that you can plug it into other apps. So there's a variety of, there are a variety of what they call, uh, there's a connected app catalog. So things like Memento and Narado Journal and Grid Diary and MMapper, these other things that uh, can harvest data and it'll just put that data into those other things if you're using them. But even if you don't plug it into anything else, it, it's, it's just a free, super easy way for you to just get an idea of how much activity uh, you're doing every day, and it's really colorful and fun to use. It's just a, it's just a really uh, pretty app, and and when you, you know, simple to use, you tap on it, and it'll give you the the the, the new data. Uh, if you can see that, um, so I, I really recommend it. I really enjoyed it in in Europe because we're running around, sort of sightseeing, shopping, doing these different things, and you know, at the, at the end of the day, we really don't know how far we've gone. And so you can look at it and go, wow, not really very far, actually. Uh, we, uh, we've gone uh, less than a mile. So it's, it's a great uh, way for those of us who sit around too much to uh, start to measure uh, how much we're moving and uh, how much time we're spending moving. Uh, and again, brain dead simple. You don't even have to actually do anything uh, in order to use it. Beautiful. I mean, what, I, maybe it's part of our generation having grown up on video games that you can't be motivated to do something unless there's a score <laughs> attached to it. Where I mean, exactly. I, I didn't be, I didn't become a care I didn't become like a fuel efficient driver until I got a gizmo that gives me a score <laughs> after every trip <laughs> to tell me how well I how efficiently I drove and now I try to beat the score every single time I go. So that's uh, that's, well, uh, more, that's to the, be more to the point. We, our activity our activity gravitates to the things that reward us with scores. Right. So I mean, one of the reasons that some type personality types don't get enough exercises that the video game thing gives you a score that the amount of money you make at work gives you a score you know all these things give you a score exercise doesn't give you a score so um, now it does right yeah i mean yeah, I, exactly. I, I didn't I, I didn't really get into the, the this, this fitness hardware until i was testing out the strive i was in dublin and i'm always walking 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 when i travel because that's, that's how i love to explore and when i came back get, got back to the hotel not feeling particularly tired and saw oh sixteen thousand steps in five hours. All right, then that's a good, that's a high number. Yeah. I, I like that number. That's a, that's the benchmark for high numbers now. So yeah. And and, not, and that's another cool thing we're going to see for the M7 processor on the yes. five, 5S. I think just as a, something that can track your movement, like your, your steps and your activity all, all day long without burning battery, that's going to be really, that's going to be cool to play with. Uh, my pick of the week is, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say on, on the talk show, Dave Whiskus was mentioning whether Fitbit and, you know, Nike's already got an app, but whether Fitbit and all these hardware companies will be making dedicated apps just for the M7 and you won't have to have a second dongle anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're going to want to have a way to lock you into like one service as the canonical repository of your activity. Just like Strive, I mean, it's, it's Strive is, I'm, I'm not joking. I've talked to so many people for whom it, it almost gets them upset, angry, as though how dare that person bike this route faster than I bike this <laughs> route. Uh, first, we're going to have some words, but first I'm going to have to get that crown back. And was, so once you're in the ecosystem of Nike data of where you're posting with your friends, it's like it's like you might not like Facebook, but if all your friends are on Facebook, that's where you go. So I'm sure that's I'm sure you're right. I'm sure that's exactly what we're going to see. Uh, my pick of the week is actually sort of a piggyback onto uh, one of Alex Lindsay's picks of the week a number uh, a couple of months ago. He recommended a version of the a 511 Tactical Rush backpack, and I saw the site, and his he recommended the version of this backpack that is big enough for Alex Lindsay to go all the way around the world in, carrying enough data to replicate NBC Nightly News's ability to live cover data. Uh, I'm looking for I my needs are more along the lines of uh, I'm not going to be gone for just about a day. I'm going to be gone for. Uh, a couple of days. I'm not, I'm not going to be relying just on my laptop. I got all kinds of little things. Uh, so I looked at the Rush 12, which is a smaller version of that same backpack. And I really, really like it so much so that after I review it, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to the website and actually buy one for myself. Um, what I like about it is that you never know exactly what you need for any one given situation. So the good news is that really big well compartment inside here for putting a couple of days worth of clothes, that'll work fine. As you can see from the top here, it's got about 10 or 12 little like pouches and bags for cables and toiletries and stuff like that. So it's not quite so easy to lose stuff inside there. Um, but on top of everything else, instead of giving you a tour of the entire bag, oh, actually one, one cool thing, it has also 
a reinforced compartment in the back area here, which is certainly big enough for an iPad. It's even big enough for a slim 13 inch notebook. So if you're ever concerned about walking through a city and maybe if you're not being attentive enough, someone is going to unzip your bag without you knowing it and reach in and rifle through. They're not getting at this pouch right here that's against your bag, against your back. Very comfortable, really thick straps. Uh, but the other thing that I'd like to point out uh, is that it has these uh, th these webbing straps here that make it really exactly what you want when you're traveling. Uh, these aren't just decorative. They are. There is actually a standardized system so that if you decided that really, I, I, the only thing I really want, I, I wish this had, was a way that a, a carrier for for my tripod, or I wish that there, I've got this uh, this big camera thing for uh, for my SLR body uh, that I don't want that gets lost inside this bag. What you can do is you can buy a bag that's designed to loop it, like lock into these uh, these mesh uh, areas, and essentially you now have a integral uh, uh, carrier for your uh, for your uh, for your tripod, an integral uh, pouch for uh, your medicines, an integral pouch for whatever you want to put in there so it's very very customizable uh and, and and it's also just built like a tank it's just thick <laughs> nylon uh good high quality zippers so as a result it's not the cheapest bag you can get uh, for a backpack it's cost like 110 dollars off the site uh but in terms of buying one thing that will last you for many many years as opposed to something that you will pay 70 dollars for and it will work fine for you for this year until you buy a different notebook or until you decide that you're going to, as you start traveling with a couple of lenses instead of just one, uh, it, this, this is a, this is more of, of a long-term investment. Um, it's perfect. I'm going to be taking along with me my trip, uh, next week, which is just an overnight, but I've got extra clothes. I'm going to have to take a lot of tech gear. Uh, so it's small enough so that, uh, small enough that you can slip it underneath a, a seat big enough that it might be the only thing you need to carry on. Uh, so that is my pick of the week. That's it for this week. Let's thank everybody who made this show such a wonderful success. Renee, uh, you're, I hope that you're getting some sleep. I hope you've, your iMore is successful enough that you can delegate some things. I hope you have, again, interns that you can just sort of toss out the side of the road like an empty Starbucks cup when you're done with them because uh, this is probably a hard week for someone like you, Renee. What's, what, what are people looking forward to seeing at iMore.com this week? Uh, tomorrow, I mean, well, first of all, we have Peter Cohen and uh, Richard Devine and Ali Kazmuha and everybody doing, you know, yeoman's work so that I can work on the reviews. But we have the iOS 7 review coming up and then the phone reviews, um, <laughs> which, we'll, which we'll follow shortly thereafter. And I think just like you, Andy, I mean, this kind of year, I'm, I, I don't expect any sleep. I just expect large amounts <laughs> of caffeine. Exactly. At least we have, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have authority to have Red Bull and, and, and sugary sodas this week. Uh, Mike. Thank you for, for coming by this this week. Where where the heck can people find you? I never know where to point people because you, you have such great analysis, things that I almost never think of and then think, I'm going to have to find a way to rephrase what Mike just said so that it, it will occur to people that I actually said that instead of him just quoting something that Mike said. Well, thank you. And I, I'm obsessed with Google+, Plus, so I put everything that I write uh, on Google+, Plus, and I also think out loud on Google+. Plus. So... <laughs> Um, really, just if uh, anybody is interested in following me, Google Plus is the place to do it. You can also follow me on Twitter. I automatically post my Google Plus stuff to Twitter and Facebook. So whatever your preferred social network is, uh, yeah, just uh, follow me there and um, I can be found with an easy search. Super. Uh, and uh, you can find my writings on the SunTimes site uh, as well as their SunTimes business site, uh, chicagogrid.com. If you want to check out my blog, my Twitter and stuff like that, you can find links to enotgo.com. Please, you don't have to download the video portion of this podcast to figure out how to spell my last name. But what your reward for figuring out how to spell my last name is, you can access enotgo.com. That's it for Mac Break Weekly this week. Next week, Renee is going to be hosting while I am away. We're, so we're going to be sort of round robining this. Uh, until then, get back to work because break time is over. <laughs> <laughs>